good. Oh, it looks like we are streaming live now. Thank you, Andy, very much for getting us up and running. Yes, we're, we're live. I think I just started too soon there. So we're good to go. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And good evening, everyone, to the School District 61's board meeting. It's September 27th. I would like to take this moment to uh, recognize and acknowledge the Esquimalt and Songhees nations on whose traditional territories we live, we learn, and we do our work. My name is Ann Whitaker. I'm the chair of the Board of Education of School District 61, and I'm a second generation settler and have spent most of my life on the island. I grew up north of here on the traditional territory of the Snanamo First Nation, and my family on my father's side has resided here in the traditional territories of the Lekwungen peoples since my grandmother arrived as a child from Great Britain. I too am very grateful to have been able to raise my three children here. On my mother's side, the family settled on the unceded territory of the Silk people before leaving or after leaving Prussia. I'm deeply honored to be given the opportunity to be the chair of the Greater Victoria Board of Education. And I want to acknowledge the privilege and the responsibility that I feel has been given to me in this role. To walk and learn alongside my colleagues, teachers, administrators, students, and communities to create and support inclusive and culturally responsive learning environments that improve all learners' personal and academic success. It is a very great honor and I'm humbled to do this work. As you can see, the board this evening in recognition of the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation and Orange Shirt Day. All week, schools and School District 61 will be engaging in activities and learning about the history and legacy of residential schools alongside the resiliency of Indigenous worldviews and perspectives. As a public education system, as a district, and as a board of education, it is our responsibility to act upon the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action for education, six through 12 and 57, to engage with in initiatives that honor the truth and history of Aboriginal peoples in Canada, to recognize the thousands of lives harmed by residential schools and how that legacy and its effects need to be part of the work we do in schools. My gratitude goes out to our Indigenous Education Department and the many teachers and staff in our schools who have been planning and preparing the important activities and events across the district for all learners. Before we move on to approve the agenda, I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce the people in the room, which is a little bit challenging on Zoom. So maybe what I can ask is, as I read your name, there's many of us here this evening, maybe you could just give a quick wave. So I have Vice Chair Rob Painter with us this evening. We have Trustees Nicole Duncan, Angie Hensa, Tom Ferris, Elaine Leonard, Diane McNally, Ryan Painter, and Jordan Waters. From our staff, we have Interim Superintendent Deb Whitten, Secretary Treasurer Kim Morris, Interim Deputy Superintendent Colin Robbins, Robert, sorry, Associate Superintendent Harold Caldwell, Associate Secretary Treasurer Katrina Stride, Director of Facilities and Services Chuck Morris, Director of Information Technology for Learning Andy Canty, Director Administrator for the Indigenous Education Department Shelley Nemi. We also have stakeholders and right holders in the group. We have the president of QP 947, Jane Massey. We have president of the GVTA, Winona Waldron. The president of the ASA, Janet Alexander. President of BC PAC, Angela Carmichael. President of the VP, PVPA, Connor McCoy. And we also have Julie Luntner with us from our, I'm sorry, Julie, I've lost your title. And we also have a guest with us this evening, Lenora, Leah, Lenora Lee from KPMG. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. If I have missed anyone, my apologies. Uh, it will get better as, this, as we go along. 
So next I'm going to seek an approval of the agenda. And I believe we have some amendments. First, I'm gonna to go to Secretary Treasurer Kim Morris. If you Thank can. You. Um, to the agenda, we would like to add um, um, audit findings report to new B1 uh, so that our guest uh, Lenora Lee from KPMG can uh, provide her presentation and then depart. Uh, we'd like to add a new E2BB, which is uh, the Lansdowne bylaw reconsideration. And I have a motion for that, uh, which would read that the Board of Education of School District number 61 uh, reconsider the May 17th, 2021 bylaw reading one, disposing of 7.3 acres of Lansdowne Middle School lands to school district number 93. Uh, we'd also like to add uh, G4, a three-year lamps and lease renewal, G5, uh, framework agreement uh, for SJ Burnside lands between school district 61 and Pacifica and the Cedar Hill Middle School uh, replacement project design and neighborhood Le learning center consultation plan. Thank you. Can you just tell me again what G4 was? I missed. G4 is the three-year lease renewal at Lampson with um, the Francophone school district. Thank you. When we get there, if I'm off, somebody please get me back on track. Do we have any other changes to the amendment or to the uh, agenda? Trustee Rob Painter. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to add a brief trustee report at C2. Thank you. Are there any other changes or additions to the agenda? Thank you. And just so you know, there are two pages of uh, faces in front of me. So if I miss you, please do interrupt. Okay, I might not be able to see you at the moment. All right, Trustee McNally. I can't hear you. Um, uh, just before the agenda is approved, there's been uh, a lot of additions and um, I'm not familiar with the uh, S.J. Willis and Pacifica issue. Um, undoubtedly, that's my fault. But uh, before I uh, approve the agenda, I'd like to know a bit more about what that is. Maybe I'm the only one who doesn't know, but still, I don't know. Uh, okay, so it's what we're looking at is disclosing information from uh, the in-camera meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or changes? Okay, seeing none, I'm looking for a mover to approve this agenda. Trustee Ryan Painter and a seconder, Trustee Jordan Waters. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, those opposed? Thank you. Angie, can you wave for me for a minute? I can't find you. Where are you? Okay. We're good to go. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Next on our agenda, we have the approval of the minutes of the June 2nd, 2021 special board minutes. Do I have a mover for this? To approve this, these minutes? Trustee Ferris and Trustee Ryan Painter. Are there any questions or changes? Seeing no, none, all those in favor of approving these minutes, please raise your hand. Motion is carried, thank you. Approval of the June 3rd, 2021 special minutes. Do I have a mover, Tom Ferris and Trustee Leonard? All those in favor, please raise your hands. Thank you, carried. Now we have that the June 21, 2021 regular board minutes be approved. Do I have a mover? Trustee Leonard, Trustee Ryan Painter, all those in favor? Okay, approved. That the June 24th, 2021 special board minutes be approved. A mover, Trustee Leonard, Trustee Ferris, all those in favor? 
Thank you, carried one more that the August 9th, 2021 special board minutes be approved. I need a mover, Trustee Leonard, Trustee Ryan Painter, all those in favor. Thank you, carried. Is there any business arising from these minutes? Okay, seeing none, we will move on. Next, we have student achievement. I have nothing there. Next, we are going to go to community presentations. And I want to thank all of you for coming this evening. Oh, actually, just before I go there, I also wanted to mention to all of those viewing in the public that we will be taking questions in the question period. And I just wanna give you the opportunity to write down the email and get your questions in in advance. The question, uh, you can email to question period at schooldistrict61.bc.ca. Okay, thank you. Um, so next, community presentations. I wanna thank you for, thank our presenters this evening for taking the time to bring their thoughts and their ideas to the board. Presenters are provided five minutes to address the board. So I will raise my hand to visually warn you at about four and a half minutes. And I hope this will allow you enough time to wrap up your thoughts and conclude your presentation. We'll do the best we can, because again, I, I can't see everybody. But first we have Melody Burns. Are you here, Melody? There you are, excellent. Thank you, Melody. I cede the floor to you. I can't hear, okay, there you go. There you go. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here tonight. I want to also include my son, James, who I'm gonna be speaking about. Um, I couldn't put a presentation together. Uh, life got in the way, work decided to be ultra busy and we got hit with a gastrointestinal uh, bug this weekend. So it was not in the cards for us, but uh, my son is who we'll be talking about tonight, um, who I'm, extraordinarily proud of and um, anyway, yeah, so that's who I'm gonna be talking about. Um, I'm here, he is in the, uh, I'm gonna say it twice tonight and then I don't wanna say it anymore. He's in the low incidence program. Uh, it's a district program held at Arbutus Global Middle School. Um, and that's what I'm here to really celebrate tonight. Um, I, I couldn't, I can't say enough about this program, it is, it's everything to us. Um, it is, it's, anyway, I'll get into it. <laughs> um, I really appreciate the time that you're taking to have me present to you tonight. Um, so our educational journey has been unconventional. Um, it's been quite a roller coaster. So I wanna share with you how we've ended up at the LI program held at Arbutus and talk about the vital resource this is in our community and to kids like James and our family and other families. James re received his diagnosis of autism at the age of three after arriving back to Canada. In the early days, um, I thought that with enough therapy that we'd arrive to kindergarten just like every other kid, you wouldn't even know the difference. Um, obviously, I knew nothing about autism or had any understanding about it at that point. And I also didn't have any acceptance around diversity. Um, when he started at Brayfoot Elementary, a lovely school with Principal Taj Mann, who is beloved in the community, uh, James scribbled, struggled more than most kids do. And it was clear by the end of kindy that James was going to need a lot more than the regular classroom could provide. But I didn't have the language or the knowledge to, um, to know what to do or where to go. I just knew that James wasn't going to grow into his potential in the mainstream classroom. Uh, James then transitioned to a private learning center that our therapy center operated at the time, and he was there for two years. Yes, you can go play. Yes, thank you for being here. Yep, go play. That's okay. Um, when after after the therapy center, uh, the learning center, we then transitioned to distributed learning with access to. <coughs> sorry, just a sec. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that was a bit loud. Okay, um, sorry, we transitioned to distributed learning. 
And we had access to the ministry funding that comes along with distributed uh, learning for kids with extra needs. Uh, we had our autism funding and with private funding, we hired a one-to-one -one tutor. Uh, this was the boost that James needed to set him up for success. We were uh, starting from a place where he had zero communication. After years of failed attempts, no communication whatsoever. Um, and so he had no output to show us what he knew. Over two years, he gained sign language that he initiated, um, an AAC on an iPad for, as a communication tool, the ability to point, which he didn't have before, and many other tools to express himself. James started to love learning, which was a huge, huge to me, very big. Um, he felt understood. He was confident and he was finally showing an interest in other kids. His growth paired with the financial exp expense of us paying for this kind of one-to-one -one instruction led us back into the public school system. Um, just after, uh, after just about five months in grade five, so he transitioned in, in partway through grade five and then he we found out about the LI program and then he moved into grade six. Um, at Arbutus. I learned about the program through a parent at Special Olympics whose child also attended. This program is the perfect blend of our experience of distributed learning with classroom benefits with being with peers. When James was in 100% inclusion in grade five, um, his educational and social needs were not able to be met. The EAE and the teacher did their very best, um, but often he was sent home with cutting and pasting and told he was having a good day. Um, again, we came through, that's not a whole lot of fault of the school at the time. I mean, we came through in January. So, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of things at play there. Um, but even so it, it wasn't quite, it wasn't the right fit. Um, so. Melody, I am gonna ask you to start wrapping up. Okay. Um, this is what happens when you try and do a presentation off of completely written notes. Uh, so James, I just wanna make a note about peers because that's really important to me. Um, James's peers are the kids that he spends time with on weekends, at sports, and that I have a bond with their parents. It's great for that um, learning about the community resources, and a well-being for the whole family. The peers that he, his age peers are growing at a different rate that James isn't able to keep up with. It's, it's I understand, while I agree with the exposure for a more wholesome community acceptance for people with diversity as a long-term goal, the immediate needs uh, to assist James in reaching his potential outweighs the community long-term goals. So James is at Arbutus, the teacher and his EA tailor his educational materials based off of James. They're responsive to providing new learning opportunities that align with his broader IEP goals. The class makes meaningful connections with the more broad school and participates when it's right for James and for each child. The class makes- Melody? Our, mm -hmm. Melody? Yes? I really appreciate you coming. We are at about eight minutes now. What I am going to ask is, can you send us an email? I uh, I, I, we we are, uh, on the board are very aware of the Arbutus program, and we and I think I agree with you. They do fabulous work, but we do want to hear more about what you have to say. I know that you've had a had a challenging week, and I I absolutely appreciate that. We'd love to have you back, or please email us those points that you want to make, and when you've got a little bit more time. But uh, for tonight, I do have to move on. We have a okay, very- Okay, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. You'll all get the uh, notes, my, my well-written uh, five minute to the T speech <laughs> that I was going to give. Excellent, Melody, thank you. And you have a lovely evening. Thank you so much. Next on our agenda, I have Kelly Co. Kelly, are you here? There you are. Hi, yes, I am. Excellent. Well, take it away. 
Well, I'm going to be piggybacking off Melody because much like her son, James, who is a year older than my boy Atticus, he is as well in the uh, LI program at Arbutus. Um, I was going to also tell our story of how we've come to the public school arena and what our journey was like, but I don't want to take up a lot of your time, but um, I do want to mention that there are some amazing, fabulous teachers that have helped guide us along our way that have held our hand. Sorry. Um, but Atticus has found a home at Arbutus. Um, James, I, I do know James. They have grown up in their therapy sessions together. James has the ability to sit and learn and communicate what he's learning. My son has autism and ADHD and has a lot more um, physical needs than um, those of his his peers. And to um, add on to what Melody has said, the connections that those children make in that class are it's unimaginable. My my son goes on a, a paper out once a week. Him and his his peers roll papers. They're learning life skills. They're they've started a store. So my child is not only learning how to print his name, but he's learning the value of money. Things that um, autism therapy won't pay for. Our funding doesn't pay for anymore because everything is so expensive <laughs> to do privately so to have um Atticus and his peers together learning together learning things on their level is um amazing it's it's what our children need there's the old graphic that I'm sure you've all seen about equality doesn't equal fairness of, you know, looking over the field, watching the baseball game, give everybody the box to see it, but the short one needs three boxes, right? Um, they are, and, and Matt Bolton, I can't say enough about Matt Bolton and how he genuinely cares about the children and really wants what's best for them and sees how they struggle and looks for answers for us they he works together with us so amazingly um i know melody is going to send an email and she's she's the one with the words <laughs> and who can say it a lot more eloquently because i've running on about six hours of sleep this weekend but um they they need this this program it's I I myself am an EA I work at a preschool hi Elaine um <laughs> and um I'm my job is called an integration support worker my job is to integrate children with special needs into the regular classroom at that age it's amazing even elementary Uh -oh. school you can see where the children are learning from each other but now that our our boys are the children are going into their teenage years their their differences are just that much more apparent that they're not learning from each other the way that they do in the younger years they're socially I should say um you know while you know, most 13 year olds are looking at TikTok dances. My son is still singing old McDonald's. It's just sometimes the growth is too far apart that they're not going to get enough from each other in a, a typical classroom. That's why these programs are so important. I was lucky enough to find out from my learning support teacher who was up until this year told that the program was going to be canceled. I had teachers, um, I had a, a teacher who loved my child so much that she asked how comfortable I was in my house because Dunsmere had this an amazing program um, and maybe I should move school districts. 
because she didn't even know about this. And this woman was all about inclusion. So, I mean, even teachers in the district don't know that the LI program is still running. Um, so Kelly, I'm going to ask you to wrap up. Okay. Um, but yes, it is just, it's, it's so important. That's all I can Kelly, say. Thank you. Kelly and Melody, I want to thank both of you very much for your bravery and for your honesty and telling your story and the challenges that you do have with raising your children. Um, it's those stories that really help inform the board and inform our work. So I, I just want to let you both know how appreciative we are of you sharing your stories with us. Melody did ask where to send an email to through the chat. And I'm going to make the suggestion that you can email the trustees at trustees at sd61.bc.ca. So thank you both very much. And I look forward to hearing more. Thank you. Thank you. So next, Jessica Vanderveen. Everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. It's 19 years since I came to the board and said, please don't shorten the lunch hours. And here I am again. And it always seems like um, oh, the desperate need to save another penny makes for some not great decisions. And I think that shortening the lunch hours is a mistake. Uh, so I've come out of retirement as a parent and come out of retirement as an advocate and uh, to tell you about this because I think it's so important. I understand that the decision has been framed as operational as opposed to policy, but I really think this decision will affect every personal and educational outcome of every child in the district. So with respect, I would ask the board to reframe this issue as the policy decision that it is. It's a decision that's a mistake. We are now calling lunch eating time 20 minutes of instructional time while eating, but we all know it's 20 quality teaching time minutes being lost. This is a modeling behavior to the students around eating and working at the same time, which we know is connected to obesity and loss of social skills that are an important element of eating rituals in our culture. It is a lost opportunity for quiet reflection and digestion of both the food and the events of the morning. So calling it instructional time just doesn't accurately portray which what, what is happening, which is that 100 minutes a week, 440 minutes of quality teaching and learning time are being lost per month. That's 7.3 hours per month of quality teaching time being lost. Even showing an instructional video during lunch will reinforce eating in front of a screen. It's not healthy and it's not quality. However, I really want to emphasize this. My main objection to shortening lunch hours is the lost opportunity for emotional first aid. So much emotional first aid takes place during the breaks, during that lunch hour. Kids that will cut and run the second that school is over are accessible to the teachers to for referral, for quick emotional first aid, for uh, finding out stuff about the family that needs to be known that would never be found out any other way. And that extra 20 minutes is, it's priceless. It's also a time when teachers consult with each other and also do first aid with each other, emotional first aid. And by God, I still don't know how teachers go into a class full of 25 kids or 30 kids and teach. I just don't even know. So the idea that they could get together with each other and seek counsel from each other, both about the children and for themselves, I think it's so valuable. I think it's priceless. Um, the teachers and the kids will be strung out after lunch. They just will. Another issue is the kids who desperately need more time to move. Cutting recess from 20 minutes to 15 minutes in the morning is going to put those kids who are most restless in class and least able to settle in an even more difficult position. Of course, this affects every child in the classroom because every child's behavior affects all the other children. And also, I understand that the hours of the recesses have been adjusted. And all I can say is, 
are you telling me that you're jeopardizing the learning outcomes of thousands of elementary school students for the sake of five minutes for a few parents who have kids at different schools, especially when the schools are at least five minutes apart? Like uh, that one, I just don't get. I don't get it at all. And why has recess been moved to 10.05 when it used to be 10.20 to 10.40? They, they just got there. They just settled in. They're at their brightest. They've still got breakfast in their stomach. And 10.05, up they all go outside instead of 10.20. That's 15 of the best minutes of the day of learning that just got pushed out. The changes to break times and meal times are a mistake. And that's okay. But I think it has to be corrected. If not, it's not okay. I understand the budgetary pressures on all of you, and I understand the needs of kids and teachers, and this is not the way to make education better. One teacher told me she can't remember when she last heard the word excellence with reference to K-12 education. We're all pinching for what we can get. I see you, Anne. My kid graduated in 2012. She got an excellent education at SD61, partly because she's freakishly adaptable, and partly because of me writing this same communique 18 years ago about lunch hours. And mainly because the teachers and board leadership still had the capacity to strive for excellence. It's time to push back at the government and tell them you need more money rather than changing these lunch hours. It's an honest mistake, I get it, but please consider canceling this decision and restoring proper and properly timed breaks to school district 61. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. You give us a lot to think about and I appreciate uh, your presentation and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this as the uh, year progresses. Thank you very, very much for your time. That concludes our community presentations for this evening. Uh, so next uh, we are going to go to B1, which will be Lenora Lee and KPMG. If I could find where they originally started. So Lenora, I am going to pass it over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks for having me. I wanted to take a few minutes to take you through the audit findings report, which is on page 106 of your package. Uh, the audit findings report has been discussed with the audit committee last week um, and is in your package for a recommendation of receipt and approval. Uh, the audit findings report describes the areas of focus in conducting the audit and the results of the procedures that we performed. Overall, we are in exactly the right spot that we would expect to be tonight. Uh, the, the audit is substantially complete and the only matters that are outstanding at this time are discussion with the board and um, approval of the financial statements that are also included in tonight's package. Uh, at that time, we'll exchange the representation letter for the audit report and uh, conclude on this year's audit. The areas of focus are included in this audit findings report, and those were consistent with those that were planned at the initial stages of the audit. In terms of any uh, audit adjustments or audit differences, there were no adjustments that were noted as part of the audit process. Overall, it was a very clean audit and we did not recommend any adjustments as a result of errors that we noted in our procedures. There's one unadjusted audit difference and it relates to a timing difference. So it's the only time that you'll see this particular item. Uh, it is resolved, caught up and uh, will be clear in the next year. It relates to timing of uh, disposals and it's driven by a ministry Excel template on a calculation um, related to a catch up adjustment on disposals. So there's no impact to the financial statements here. Uh, the impact is limited to the capital fund and it affects both the cost and accumulated amortization, but a net zero impact on the numbers within the financial statements. We do confirm in our auditors report our independence. So there's been no uh, services provided to the district uh, that would impair our ability to conduct an independent audit. In terms of some of the highlights of our audit procedures, uh, we did focus this year on the impact of COVID-19. 
as it relates to the financial statements. This year, the district received about 8.9 million of both provincial and federal monies, uh, noted as the safe return to school and safe return to class monies. In terms of the grants received, we confirmed directly with the Ministry of Education the amounts that were received and compared the amounts the Ministry had reported in their books and records to what is reported in the financial statements of the school district. We also tested some of the expenditures during the year. There were restrictions related to how these monies were spent, and so we tested the eligibility of expenses and how they were applied. We did not note any issues or adjustments in this area, and uh, the monies that we tested were spent in ways that were appropriate and consistent with the recommendations. There is approximately 614,000 of unspent monies remaining, and uh, the district is waiting for approval from the ministry in order to uh, determine how to spend or return those monies in fiscal 2022. The auditor's report, as you'll see, is a clean and unqualified audit opinion. Uh, it is reported on a compliance framework. And what that means basically is that the financial statements are prepared in accordance with the rules that the ministry requires you to follow. There was no uh, deviations or qualifications to our opinion. The next few pages and slides I'll speak to are just some highlights of the audit procedures performed in other areas of the financial statements. And these follow the main transaction streams of the school district. In the area of procurement, which is mostly made up of services and supplies, uh, we compare that spend or what's been reported in the financial statements to both budget and previous years, uh, developing uh, an expectation of what we think current year values are going to be uh, comparing to actual and investigating any significant differences. And we had no issues noted in this testing. In the area of capital assets, there was about 31.6 million spent on capital additions this year. That related primarily to seismic upgrades and other capital projects like Campus View Elementary, Vikai and Brayfoot. Our audit work here is comprised of agreeing capital additions to source documentation, invoices from contractors. Uh, we also test the amortization or the depreciation that's been reported in the financial statements. And there was no adjustments in this area. In terms of salaries and benefits expense, this represents one of the largest expenses of the school district and uh, totaling about 215 million in fiscal 2021. Again, in this area, we compare actual spend to both budget and previous years and investigate any significant differences. We also confirm directly the employee future benefit liabilities. These are obligations um, related to things such as vacation and sick pay, retirement gratuities that are earned by employees during their service and are paid out at a retirement date. Uh, the ministry engages Mercer as a third party to value these liabilities for all school districts across the province. Uh, and so we confirm directly with Mercer that the amounts recorded in the school district's financial statements are consistent with what they have estimated and reported. We also test some of the key assumptions that go into that valuation, things such as the discount rate and the average service life of employees. And uh, we noted that the financial statements are consistent with the confirmation that we received. School generated funds represent monies that are managed at the school level and uh, are restricted in the financial statements. They represent about 3.7 million reported in the financial statements. In this area, we confirm directly with the bank or the financial institution of the district that the money is on hand and reported in the statements agree to what the bank has in their records, and we did not note any deviations or differences. And lastly, in the area of revenue, uh, we, we again confirm directly with the ministry the amounts that have been received and provided to the district during the year. We also test that those amounts are recorded in the right bucket or fund as to operating special purpose or capital monies. Uh, we test particular special purpose funds such as the classroom enhancement fund 
as well as I mentioned the COVID-19 grants, that those monies have been spent as restricted and as designated by the province. We didn't note any adjustments in this area. And lastly, in all audits, we are required to perform certain procedures over fraud risk, and in particular, management override of controls. Uh, there are uh, situations in which management is in a position to post entries that are outside of the regular day-to-day -day operating activities. And so as part of our audit procedures, we review what those are, compare against any particular biases or incentives in the preparation of financial statements. And we also evaluate uh, any unusual transactions that are reported uh, in the financial statements. These are required procedures regardless of uh, size of an organization or industry or risk. Uh, they are embedded into the audit standards that uh, they're required in all audits. Uh, we had no concerns to bring to your attention in this testing area. Uh, there is a new audit standard uh, that was implemented this year. It relates to estimates. And uh, in this area, we are required to uh, audit estimates to a more granular level of detail, reviewing the data methods and assumptions that are uh, built into estimates. And so we conducted uh, that work during this year and incorporated the new audit work into our uh, procedures. Uh, we have not noted any control deficiencies in the course of our audit. Our work is focused on primarily budget to actual review, as well as uh, approval of payroll. Um, and in those areas, we noted that the controls are, effect are operating effectively and expected. And the last area uh, noted in our findings report on page 119 of your package is a summary of some new requirements that were released by the ministry just at the end of June, 2021. Uh, there are some new requirements related to the categorization of operating surpluses, as well as linking operating surpluses to the district strategic plan. And uh, as the companion guide to this new expectation is released, uh, we'd simply recommend that the district compare its existing policy uh, to the new requirements and, and update as needed. I won't go through the appendices to the audit findings report. It has information about uh, upcoming accounting standards. We will be working with management um, on the adoption of a new standard in fiscal 2023. And it relates to accounting and recognition of asset retirement obligations. We have spoken about this one with the board in previous years. And there is periodic reporting that's required by the ministry uh, to ensure that districts are keeping pace and, and ready for the adoption in advance of 2023. So we'll continue to work with management to review that as information is ready, um, such that you're prepared for that adoption date in advance of 2023. Those were the highlights that I wanted to touch on on the audit findings report. Um, certainly a big thank you to the finance team for all of their assistance with the audit process. Um, it is a very quick turnaround that uh, for a June 30th year end, we're typically auditing in about the third week of July. Um, and as wow. you can see, a very clean result as well with uh, no audit adjustments that were noted. Um, so very much appreciate the assistance and um, this year we were actually able to spend a few days on site too at the school board office, which was uh, very welcome after a year of uh, working th remotely through COVID. So I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Lenora. Are there any questions? I am uh, trustee Nicole Duncan. Yeah, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Ms. Lee. Appreciate um, you presenting your report um, to us. I had a, a question mo uh, around methodology. So I noticed as I was reading through the report, there's quite a number of references to um, phrases like uh, significant variance, um, significant difference. I wondered if you could contextualize for the board what you as an auditor consider significant. So what you're looking for when you're going and you're conducting your audit and what you would consider to be significant. Sure. So 
The audit is driven by materiality. In the auditor's report, you'll see the language is noted that there's no material errors. Uh, we establish materiality on an annual basis, generally driven by operating revenue or expenses. Uh, the audit standards prescribe a range um, of uh, reasonable materiality. Uh, for the current year, that level was established at 1.76% of revenues. And the audit standards allow a range between 0.5% and 3%. Uh, so overall materiality was established at 4.4 million. Um, that's really only relevant at the conclusion of our audit when we step back and are prepared to issue our auditor's report. If there were differences greater than that 4.4 million, uh, we may need to modify our opinion. Um, when we test individual audit transactions and streams of transactions, we are testing to a much lower level of detail. So we're not ignoring everything that's uh, less than 4.4 million. There's also a, um, a term in the audit methodology called an audit posting threshold. So if we note an error, um, we would recommend it for adjustment if it's greater than a de minimis threshold. That was established at 220,000 for fiscal 2021. Uh, so when I've indicated that there was no audit errors that were noted or adjusted, it's at that $220,000 level. Hopefully that provides a little bit of background and context to the question, but uh, happy to contribute more if there's more clarification needed. Thank you. Trustee Duncan for a follow-up. Yeah, I know. Thank you. That um, is very, very helpful. Um, that's exactly what I was looking for. So thank you so much for that clarification. Um, and just a quick follow up. So at the lower threshold, um, so the $220,000 benchmark, I guess I would call it uh, as a layperson. Um, I'm, and so what what happens as an auditor, wh where were you to become aware of something lower than that $220,000 threshold or benchmark? Um, do you collect those and then provide those to management um, or is it something that you simply provide no comment on at all? We would typically accumulate and also provide those to management. Um, they wouldn't necessarily be reported individually in our report, but if there are a number of them, uh, they could accumulate to a value greater than 220,000. And we'd also consider the nature of them. If they were of a similar nature and there was risk that they could um, become at some point a material amount, that's where we may report a control observation, an area for improvement in internal controls. Go ahead, Trustee Duncan. Thank you. And then just my final question. Um, I wondered, so when it comes to um, conducting your audit and assessing the risks um, of fraud or error, I'm wondering again, if you can provide the board with a bit of context on, in terms of how you actually do that. So um, if, if you could give us some examples of both what you look for as an auditor when you're conducting your audit and also um, the extent to which you're relying on um, management to, to bring forward or raise areas of concern or potential concern? Sure. Uh, so we do hold um, inquiries throughout the year with management as to any areas of concern and, and take that into account in developing our audit procedures. Uh, when it relates to fraud evaluation, um, we typically consider the areas of incentive, bias, and opportunity. Um, in particular, in a public sector organization that is required to uh, demonstrate and show a balanced budget, uh, we, we may look to transactions recorded in and around year end that um, are, are potentially with the intent to manage that bottom line. Um, if there was an adjustment that uh, changed a surplus from a positive number to a negative number, one entry, uh, that would certainly be something that we would review as part of the audit process. So our fraud evaluation is primarily driven by our, our understanding and discussions of, of incentive bias and opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Okay, hearing none, 
Lenora, I would like to thank you ever so much for once again joining us uh, this at our annual review. Uh, it has been lovely working with you for several years now, and I'm glad to, to have you back. Um, so thank you again very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye now. Okay, so we are going to go back to correspondence um, in the agenda. So there are several pieces of correspondence included in the packet for your information and consideration. And I'm wondering if there are any items that you would like to pull out to discuss. Trustee Duncan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And pardon me, I'm just gonna make my way back up to correspondence, sorry, just bear with me. I'm wanting to pull out the, um, the correspondence um, from Ms. Humphreys around EA shortages. Okay, um, I can. Thank you for that. I do want to, with that one, just mention that we are prepared uh, super or interim superintendent Witten will be responding to those questions in that email during the Q&A section of the meeting. Does that change your thought to pull it out now? Sorry, just to clarify, do you mean the public Q&A? So yep. it, there'll be an opportunity. Um, it doesn't. Um, I think it's great that we're providing an opportunity to the public to ask questions about that, but I had my own questions I'd like to ask. I can do it now, or I'm happy to do it under trustee questions too, if that is more amenable. Uh, we can do it now. All right, so that being said, is there any, any other letters that anybody wants to pull out? We will first, we'll discuss the September 12th from Tracy Humphreys. Are there any others? No. All right. Trustee Duncan, we're going to go to your questions on that email right away. Okay. Thank you, Chair. All right. Through the Chair to in terms of Superintendent Witten, I just wondered if um, you could provide a, the board with some, again, some context around the shortages that are set out um, in that correspondence. Um, in particular, uh, the, the correspondence is, you know, addressing uh, the plans to mitigate uh, any EA shortages that we're experiencing. And um, in particular, I'm interested to hear what exactly is the nature of the shortage um, and um, how we're going to be addressing that um, and um, how improvements will be reported back to the board. Okay, thank you. In terms superintendent, in deputy, Deb Witten, oh, sorry. It's okay. Uh, yeah, so I'll address the questions. They align with the submission from uh, Tracy. So one of the questions was asking about the notion that there were four or five EAs uh, short at each school. We don't have that information at this point in time. We have averaged approximately 21 unfilled absences across the district. So when we look at 48 schools and 21 unfilled absences, I'm not suggesting that is a good thing, but I am saying it is different than four or five uh, in the school. So we need to dig a bit deeper to find out um, how that, what that thought is, whether it's a perception of um, people believing that there should be more EAs or, um, that they uh, that they ha maybe had a different number last year, but um, our unfilled absences are more in line with 21. Um, we did hire 62 EAs in the summer hiring, and approximately 30 of those EAs uh, are currently with our district. Um, we have worked closely with all principals and vice principals. We work with them throughout the month of August to ensure that there are appropriate support plans in place for students with diverse abilities and diverse needs. In some schools, we put more EAs or more support in to begin the month as we got to know our students and look at best ways to support them. So wraparound supports are or should be available to all students in class. Um, and making sure that targeted and specific supports are available to students so that they can achieve their learning goals. This type of support may be EAs. It may also be the classroom teachers, learning support teachers, counselors, and administrators. So when we're looking at support, we're not necessarily speaking about one, um, one area of support. And then around recruitment, um, we have human resource department um, 
have done a lot to recruit and retain. Um, we have, uh, we've employed bus ads, back of buses you may see have EA ads. We've also gone social media. We've utilized Make a Future and our HR website. Um, we have a letter of agreement with QP 947 to allow retired EAs the opportunity to reapply for either full-time or part-time work. Um, as you know, we've spoken before about the bridge program, which helps to identify uh, individuals with equivalent education or experience to, visit, to bridge into an EA position. Um, and we have made opportunities available for GVTA TTOCs to interview for QP 947 so that they can be called out in the morning if they don't have a TTOC call out, they may be called out to, uh, to the EA spare board. Um, we've also started a GVSD exit interview. So this has provided us with feedback from uh, QP individuals who have left the district and has given us sort of anecdotal feedback as far as why they've left. Um, at this time, the three highest reasons for leaving the district is they've left for a different sector, they've moved out of the school district, or they've left to pursue further education. And then in the anecdotal pieces, we've heard that um, the wages and number of hours was a reason to leave. And we are um, working with, and we recognize this, we're working with uh, QP, um, Jane, and HR to look at ways that we can uh, maintain hours for EAs. And we're always welcome for other recruitment strategies. But if um, I know that our HR department has done a fulsome review of this and continues to monitor and manage our unfilled absences on a daily basis. Thank you very much for those. Uh, Trustee Duncan. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you um, to the Chair, to uh, Interim Superintendent Witten. I really appreciate that that context that really helps and uh, what a fabulous idea to, to start doing exit interviews. Um, so thank you so much to you and to, and to our staff in HR for pulling that together. Um, I'm wondering that the 21 unfilled absences, um, I, I, could you just explain, you know, what period those 21 absence, uh, or I'm sorry, unfilled absences relate to? I'm wondering if it's just that we've got a, a different reporting period that we're looking at between uh, the numbers that you've quoted and, and possibly um, the, the feedback that we're getting um, from Ms. Humphreys. This was from September 7th and it worked up until I think it was the first two weeks of school. So up until the 15th of September were the numbers. Um, the question with regards to Tracy and I don't mean to speak for her, her question was, or a question posed was whether it was uh, that we were not able to find enough staff to hire or that uh, the, the EAs were not in place um, or that there was not enough funding. So I think it was, there was multiple questions within that one. Um, I'm not sure that it was that there were five missing from every school. I think we'd have to unpack that a little further to understand um, who, who and, and what people were thinking when they thought five EAs were not at each of the schools. Yeah, thank you. I look forward to, to further reporting once you have an opportunity to, to go back and, and have those dialogues. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so next we have the chair's report. And as my first official chair's report following the resignation of past chair Jordan Waters, I want to take a few moments to acknowledge parts of our story as a board. Parts that have deeply affected our relationships with partners, stakeholders, the nations and indigenous communities and with each other. During our past budget process on several occasions, comments or ideas were expressed in a manner which was divisive and racist. During our consultation process around Craig Flower and Shoreline Schools, our actions showed disrespect and closed ears to those most affected and invested in the decisions being put before us. Through our discourse with each other, we have caused harm to our relationships, 
to our integrity and to the trust of the communities we serve. Efforts to resolve our strife saw numerous consultants contracted, further diminishing funds available for classroom resources. Staff and students have felt demoralized and disconnected by the actions, comments, and direction of the board. I am most saddened knowing our actions and comments have supported paternalistic and colonial attitudes, which have deeply hurt individuals and families within our community. On behalf of the board, I want to express my deepest regret and embarrassment for these actions and comments which have caused harm across the district. I want to humbly apologize for the discourse and closed ears so many of our stakeholders and public have experienced as a result of our strife and poor leadership as trustees. I want to also acknowledge the many individuals such as Carrie Newman and Marianne Watson along with the two local na nations, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, and the Métis and urban indigenous communities that we serve. The GBTA, QP, the Victoria Confederation of Parent Advisory Councils, and others who bravely stood up to racism and clearly directed our attention to the error in our and harm in our actions, and who challenge us to do better. Our journey forward won't be easy, and at times painful as learning often is. By being open to different perspectives, examining our bias and listening with open hearts, we will build a greater appreciation and be able to embrace and preserve traditions which build a positive sense of self for each student, each staff member and for ourselves. Clear solutions are hard to come by. They require time, consultation, two-way communication, a great deal of effort, and most importantly, action. As we move forward, we will need to work hard to meet demands placed in front of us. We will need to ask big questions and we will need to listen intently to the answers to hear and understand the truths being spoken before we react. The board and senior staff have already begun this work through readings and participation in cultural perspectives training. This training is focused on the assimilation and legacy of residential schools, colonization, as well as beginning to build our awareness of our own privilege and how to recognize our own biases. There is a strong commitment and desire from all to see this training and learning continue. The board is also committed to a better budget process for the coming year and has taken Joan Axford's recommendations into consideration. Already, we have participated in one of two budget working sessions, which will establish a budget committee structure and process to ensure adequate time, transparent access to information and collaborative dialogue with the public over the coming year. I know I don't have the solutions to our challenges, and I have sought advice from a wide breadth of sources on how to improve board dynamics and set us up for a positive year. I am grateful Trustee Duncan has agreed to move to the Operations Policy and Planning Committee and Trustees Waters has been appointed to the Education Policy and Directions Committee. I want to thank both Trustee Duncan and Trustee Waters for the good work I know they are both capable of doing through these committees. Additionally, as a chair, I will not be exercising my right to vote at standing committees. This will encourage the standing committees to more broadly embrace public comments, to collaborate with each other, and to reach compromises together by taking a shared ownership of any items being brought to the board. As we start a new school year with new leadership, sadly, we have not left the pandemic behind. I am so grateful and humbled by the amazing staff here in School District 61 and their caring and commitment to students. As we are all aware, the return to school has seen an increase in COVID cases and exposures in our schools. Everyone working in the system, principals, teachers, custodians, secretaries, educational assistants, our communications and senior staff have been doing everything available to them to reduce transmissions, to get those notices out to those potentially affected as quickly as possible and to keep our classrooms clean. Always keeping student connectedness at the center of the decisions 
while maintaining suitable learning environments. For some, our endeavors may not have been as quick or as perfect as we would have liked, but the effort, the long hours and the caring certainly do not go unnoticed. The board is grateful to each of you for this work. In conclusion, I would like to thank the many partner groups, staff and individuals who have reached out and expressed their cautious optimism for the year ahead. There are many conversations, much listening and learning to be done as a board and individually over the next year. I have every confidence in each of my colleagues that they are committed to doing this work. And therefore I too am optimistic that the year ahead will be transformative and that our work will focus on creating inclusive and culturally responsive learning environments that keep students at the center of our decision-making. Before I move on with the board work plan, I must also say that in addition to my previous comments, the board regrets some trustees making disparaging comments about the secretary treasurers in our meetings and on social media. This behavior is inappropriate and not representative of the board's full confidence in and support for the secretary treasurer. So I thank you for your time and for hearing my report. The next item on our business is the annual board work plan, which is included in your packet. And as you can see, the plan has shown us to be very, very busy in September. And we are going to, the one thing I wanted to highlight in that plan was the framework for enhanced student learning, which we'll be looking at later this evening. If you haven't had a chance yet to look at this, I really encourage you to do so. This is a living document that districts are required to submit to the Ministry of Education. And the report combines accountability with evidence-informed decision-making. And it also reflects a public commitment to improve student learning and well-being. So I hope you all get a chance to look at that before we get to it. So next, after the annual plan, unless there's any questions on the plan for September and October that is in your packet. So seeing no comments, I'm gonna to go to Trustee Painter for uh, a verbal report. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, mine is quite brief. Um, the moment for me to uh, acknowledge yet another aspect of the privilege that I enjoy. Uh, as, a, a, as a provincial bureaucrat over the past 18 months, I've, I have had the privilege to uh, work from home. Uh, and uh, I know that that has not been an option for many, in particular our, our staff uh, here in the district. Um, the reason I mention that is that uh, in August, uh, I transitioned from my own uh, kitchen table to the kitchen table I grew up at in Calgary, Alberta, uh, and uh, very appreciative of that opportunity to be out here to attend to uh, ongoing family uh, medical emergencies. Um, and with that in mind, I, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, the traditional territories of, and I apologize for the pronunciation, uh, Nitsitapi and the people of Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Siksika, the Pikinai, the Kainai, the Tsutina, the Stony Nakoda First Nation, including Chiniki, Bearpaw, and Wesley First Nations, and the Metis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Uh, I have to admit that uh, when I was growing up here in the 80s, uh, I did not give a lot of thought to um, the, the history and, and the ongoing reality of uh, these First Nations peoples. It's something that I, I do regret and I am trying to make amends for. Um, but at the very least, I want to acknowledge that I am privileged to be on their traditional territory. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Painter. So next on our agenda is the Education Policy and Directions Committee. The minutes are in the packet for information. I don't know if Trustee Ferris had any other further comments to make. Uh, no, I have no further comments. Thank you. Thank you. So next we will go to, oh, Trustee McNally. Thank, Thank you. you for the um, way sorry. it helps. 
<laughs> Chair, this is uh, this is just a personal point of um, privilege, I guess. Could you um, just mention every now and then which page we're on? I'm reading the agenda on my phone because my other screen is done for a while. Um, so I have a question on, on page 140, and I don't know if we're there yet. <laughs> uh, we are not quite there yet. Okay. Or, no, wait. Hang on. Where are we? <laughs> My cat bellows. Um, yeah, D Trustee McNally, you make a very good point about the page numbers. I note that my agenda also does not have the page numbers on it. So if somebody finds those page numbers and we're not there, holler out. Page 140, I just want to see what it is that your question is about. So please just bear with me for one moment. 140. So that's about the financial statements, right? So we're going to get to those very soon, but we're not there. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So operations policy and planning committee, again, the draft minutes are included. Trustee Leonard, did you want to introduce the first motion? Where are you? Uh, yes, I will. Sorry, my camera's been off. I've lost my feed twice tonight, so I'm leaving my camera off. So okay. here, here's, here's my short stint with my camera. Um, uh, so, uh, and I, and before I introduce the motion, I think we will have to have an amendment because we've directed staff, but we should be directing the superintendent to direct staff within this motion. So I'm going right. to read it how I think it should read. And then uh, if anybody has any issues, uh, we can move it as, um, as it's, I think it's a, a simple amendment. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of SD 61 Greater Victoria direct the superintendent to direct staff to determine the cost of incorporating net zero into the design of the new Cedar Hill Middle School, and further that staff report the cost, including business case, back to the board by November 2021 for board approval to consider the funds for the net zero design. Okay, thank you. Are there any comments or questions? Uh, actually, just before I go to you, Trustee Ferris, I just want to ask that question of our stakeholders before we move the motion and, and enter into debate. So are there any stakeholders that want to comment on this? Waive or interrupt because there's two pages. Okay, hearing none. No, oh, I want sorry. to hear yeah. that. So uh, President Carmichael from VCPAC. Thank you. Um, so we, we do support looking into the cost and the cost effectiveness of it, given the fact that we did declare, um, you know, a climate emergency. But we also want to make sure where the money would be coming from and whether it would be better to proceed systematically to reduce high emission areas in all schools. Because uh, we don't want to have, you know, this, have other um, programs be cut to pay for this. Um, that, that's our concern. So we definitely, we support the motion to see what the cost is and if it's effective, um, but we're just asking for transparency uh, when doing so. Thank you. Are there any other partners? No, all right. Trustee Ferris, you had a, your hand up. Uh, I just wanted to move the amendment uh, proposed by uh, Trustee Leonard. All right, it is moved by the committee and seconded then by you. Are there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Excellent, all those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously, thank you. Okay, sorry. And next we are going to the audit committee report. We have several motions here. I am not sure if Trustee Ryan Painter, if you wanted to introduce these as the committee chair. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, with the board's indulgence, um, I recommend, uh, unless uh, the secretary treasurer um, objects, that we move um, uh, all three of these motions as a group. Uh, if there are challenges with that, of course, I'm willing to be corrected, but um, uh, I think you probably find unanimous consent uh, to do that. Uh, just I'll look to, uh, through you, uh, Chair, to Secretary Treasurer, if that would be okay. And if so, I'll read these into the record. Secretary Treasurer, are you okay with that? Mm, fine with me at the Assembly's uh, 
wish. So, and then I will go to the board. Trustees, Trustee Painter. Uh, request that the uh, first motion be severed. I, I have questions on that one. Excellent, agreed. Okay, so that being said, Trustee Ryan Painter, do you want to introduce the very first motion? But just before you do that, again, I would ask, are there any partner groups that would like to speak to this motion before it is read in and you are unable to? Uh, at, uh, I do. President, President Carmichael from VC Pack. Um, you know, maybe it's because I'm new uh, at this chair job, um, but this motion was really difficult for me to understand. It was really uh, the language in it was was you know not for the layman, um, and so I guess we're kind of wanting um, a breakdown of how the appropriation of the 13 million compares with what was approved on the June budget. And it was our understanding that there would be a budget committee that would be working through those numbers. Um, and we also, I didn't really understand how school level funds differed, differed from project budgets. So I think for, for, <laughs> for this motion, we're having a hard time with the language and we're having a hard time uh, agreeing to it just because we're asking for transparency with the budget. Um, and so we're asking for that this motion be delayed until the board sets up a working committee and VCPAC could be a part of that committee because honestly, we're not understanding um, the language and we're not, it's not clear to us um, how the numbers of the budget compare with the actual numbers. All right, Secretary Treasurer. I have a short presentation on surplus I can share if that would be helpful. Do you yeah. have it ready to go? Yeah, could I share my screen? Please do. I thought I did. Additionally, uh, um, President Carmichael, uh, I would offer the uh, opportunity to your executive or to your PAC meetings if you would like uh, one, you know, myself to come and to, to help you work through that. I'm happy to support you any way we can. We would appreciate that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, so um, again, thank you to uh, Katrina Stride and her team, uh, especially Judy, Julie Lutner, uh, for their work on financial year end. I won't spend a lot of time on the uh, ins and outs of the financial report. Uh, Katrina has prepared a very comprehensive uh, audit committee presentation uh, that should be in the packet. <clears throat> uh, what I did want to do is talk about surplus so that we could connect back to the budget. And so back in May, <clears throat> during our 21-22 budget process, we were projecting an $11.9 million surplus. And the actual June year end uh, produced a $13.2 million surplus. And so that's a net increase from our budgeting or projection in the spring of $1.3 million. And just to give you an idea, 1.3 million is a lot of money, uh, but if we look at the little note below, it only represents 0.6 of our operating expenses. And so I want to speak to the financial team's um, uh, ability here to estimate so closely. Uh, it's very difficult in a $210 million budget to get this close in the projection. So um, kudos to uh, Julia and Katrina. How did the surplus change from May to year end? Uh, well, some things uh, came in uh, underspent more than we thought. So EA wages, education assistant wages, came in uh, underspent $780,000 more than we thought. And this is due to hiring lag and some of those uh, recruitment uh, and posting and filling timelines. The holdback that we were anticipating uh, was actually higher than we had estimated in the budget process, and that came in at 70000 higher. And we had TT TTOC, or our substitute teachers' uh, wages, were underspent by 165000 more than they thought they would be when we were projecting. And this is uh, due to some estimates we do around long-term leaves, like mat leave, uh, parental leave, uh, education leave, etc. 
and uh, departments were underspent by $172,000 more than we thought. So our surplus is broken down as such. And when we talk about project budgets, we are talking about um, department budgets that are targeted within um, and not at our discretion to spend elsewhere. And examples of these would be contractual pro D in the QP collective agreement or uh, the GVTA collective agreement, uh, some of the other contracts we have. Um, the other uh, things that might be targeted here are school carry forwards monies for extra or particular projects. Uh, so maybe a small capital project in their school. Uh, this might also involve a targeted fund like the Cooper Smith Library, which we um, operate in our operating fund. So it's sort of targeted. And the other uh, big piece of this in the project budgets are ministry funding for uh, curriculum and things like that that are targeted and can only be spent on uh, what the ministry asked us to spend it on. We don't have discretion to spend it on other things. The school level funds are the uh, district allocations that are held by schools uh, and carried forward year after year. And so we have a cap on these of 80,000 uh, for secondary and 80,000 for elementary and middle. And so these are the leftover budgets in the schools. Purchase order commitments are um, orders that we've put in at the end of June, but we haven't received the goods or paid for the goods yet. And so we have to hold money or carry it forward in order to pay those bills when they come in. The planned surplus to balance the budget that was passed by the board on June 3rd was 4.8 million. And so that's included in our surplus figure. And the board also planned a reserve on June 3rd of $821,000. So that is within the total surplus. Um, given that we had $1.3 million more than we thought, uh, we uh, proposed some infrastructure initiatives. And three of these, two of them are from the budget, the spring budget. One is the year one of five of the network infrastructure upgrade. And the second one is to um, complete the shops uh, safety upgrading year two of two that uh, was budgeted in AFG which is uh, extremely taxed with uh, minor capital projects like roofing and things like that. So we moved it here uh, for the board to consider. And as well, we have some enrollment growth in 22, 23 that's going to require a modular rebuilt. And that is a $200,000 amount in here as well. Uh, with the remainder of the 1.3 million, we, um, are proposing to hold an additional reserve for year, for year end. Uh, and what this would do would be to, um, for the 22-23 year as we face a potential or we face a deficit for the upcoming budget year, would help us hold some money to make less cuts in the spring um, than we would have to if we uh, simply spent this money this year. And so it's holding it as a reserve to balance 22-23. And International Program Reserve, we uh, are proposing to establish 425,000. Uh, and this is basically a contingency for international. We know that when COVID hit, we lost half of our enrollment. And so this is a small cushion to be held in reserve as well. So um, that totals $13.2 million uh, in, in surplus at the end of 2021. And just for reference, last year at this time, uh, for June 30th, 2020, we were um, holding 17.8 in reserve. And so you can see uh, where reserves are or carry forwards have gone up or down between 1920 and 2021. Our total operating budget, including the purchases of capital assets from operating uh, this year end are $210 million. And last year were 205. Uh, so the surplus of $13.2 million is 6.27% uh, of our operating expenses. And last year was 8.75, so a significant uh, reduction. And as well, a reserve of the 821,000, the 721, and the 425 is 0.93% of the uh, total operating expenses. And this is just to give you some um, idea of scale when we're talking about 
uh, amounts of money that seem very large, but in relation to the total budget are quite uh, small. And so when we're talking about a surplus being 6.27% of the uh, operating expenses or a reserve of less than 1%, uh, we should be paying attention to that. So in the previous slide, we would say that we have no discretion to make any changes to the $5.4 million. Uh, this is contractual, externally targeted and school carry forwards. We would also say in B, here, we have no uh, discretion because this is the money used to balance the 21-22 budget. We would also say that a decision was made on June 3rd under item C that we hold a $0.821 million reserve. And at the board's discretion uh, is the $1 million that we're proposing to put into year one of five of the network upgrades, year two of two of the shop safety upgrading, and the $200,000 for the enrollment growth modular. And uh, we are proposing the $1.1 million additional reserve to reduce the 22-23 budget impacts as we move through our budget process early this year and with a budget committee. I just wanted to give the group a surplus history. Uh, you may have seen this in our budgeting FAQ, but the 2021 uh, line is now completed. So you can see how through the years we've um, had unspent school budgets and how well those are coming down in terms of spending patterns. Unspent district, I will say that we did not carry forward any monies for di uh, district departments such as uh, careers or uh, district team or uh, any other departments except for the uh, Indigenous Education Department and for the International Student Program. Um, purchase order commitments, you can see the comings and goings throughout the years of uh, the orders that we've had at year end that haven't been paid for. Last year, we held a COVID contingency of 2.5. We're not holding that this year. Um, budgeted in future year's budget. So this is the money the board sets aside at budget time to balance the following year's budget. And you can see the amounts that have been used throughout the years. And in this particular year, uh, we're proposing or the board passed on June 3rd, the $4.8 million to balance the 21-22 budget. We are proposing to hold a reserve, a combination of the 800,000 approved on June 3rd and the additional increase in surplus that we've realized by year end. And this would be held in reserve in order to uh, attend to the 22-23 budget or to hold a reserve as the board is intended to do. So that's uh, something that can be decided. And again, the infrastructure proposal that we're proposing for the network upgrade, the shops and the modular classroom required for enrollment growth in 22-23 that needs to be built this year. We wanted to just give you a quick visual around the uh, surplus that's been used to balance the following year's budget. And here we see 2021 um, at less than 5 million, the 4.8 we're using to balance this year's budget at a surplus. And the surplus history overall in school district 61 for all purposes. So this is our 13.2 uh, million or 13.1 million here. So I hope that explains the budget or the surplus proposal a little uh, further uh, for the board's consideration. Right. Thank you very much for that. Um, excellent. Thank you. All right. Trustee Ryan Painter, did you want to read this motion into the record? Yes, yes, Chair, thank you. Uh, recommended motion that the Board of Education of School District Number 61 Greater Victoria approve the appropriation of $13,192,739 of the operating surplus as follows. One, school level funds, $1,972,690. Two, project budgets, $2,840,184. Three, infrastructure initiatives, $956,350, four, purchase order commitments, $618,487, five, reserves, $1,146,622, and six, balanced 2021-2022 budget, $5,658,406, including an $821,019 operating reserve approved in June 2021. 
All right. Thank you. Uh, before, well, I guess we're already there. Are there questions? Trustee Rob Painter. Uh, and through the chair, I'd like to thank the secretary treasurer for the uh, presentation. It actually helped to answer a number of the questions I have, uh, I had initially. Uh, I would like to request that the uh, presentation be added to the minutes so that we can have, this is a, uh, an ongoing uh, record of, of the discussion. Uh, the one question I do have, and I recognize that uh, it's somewhat challenging, but it's uh, to discuss at this point in time in the year, but it is my recollection that we were forecasting a, uh, a potential uh, deficit moving forward into next year. And I was wondering if the secretary treasurer uh, could provide any clarification on that, whether I'm completely out in left field or if that is what was discussed in June. Secretary Treasurer. Yeah, yes, uh, indeed that is discussed. We are expecting a deficit budget for the 22-23 year. We are closely monitoring our enrollment. Uh, it is uh, our 1701 or our data collection, student data collection snapshot is this Thursday. And so uh, we are committed to um, providing uh, an updated uh, deficit based on that 1701 enrollment, as well as the projections for uh, the next two years um, next week or the week after, so that we can get to work on budget as soon as we can. Thank you. Trustee Duncan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And uh, again, thank you to the Secretary Treasurer for the presentation. I wonder if um, we can get just some clarity on uh, whether it would be possible to simply table um, this discussion until we have uh, in a week's time a, an idea on where we are with enrollment. I would feel more comfortable having this discussion with a firm idea of what our enrollment is going to be moving forward and therefore what our funding is going to look like. Um, and it's not, a, you know, that that comment is not to say that I don't support um, some of the suggestions in, in terms of where we could put some surplus, um, but I just think it would be helpful to have the bigger picture in mind, know where we are with enrollments um, and what our funding is going to look like and then have the discussions, but I'm wondering if there's some reason we have to do it now. Secretary Treasurer on the question of where do we have to do this now? Yeah, I think that I don't see any harm in it. Um, I think that just running through the um, school level funds, again, we have no discretion, project budgets, no discretion, infrastructure, the board could discuss, purchase orders, no discretion, um, $821,000 reserves and balancing of the budget, no discretion, but the remainder um, could be discussed by the board or waylaid until or postponed until the enrollment comes in. Trustee Duncan? Yeah, just in follow up to the chair of the secretary treasurer, um, presumably too, once we know um, what our funding is gonna look like uh, moving forward, presumably some other things could be added to that list. Um, is that right? So there's some room for further reallocation of resources um, or is the intention to not make any other allocation or reallocation decisions until after we've done uh, gone through a, a budget process for the next financial year. Secretary Treasurer? Well, I think that, I guess it's going to depend on what we bring to you at the next meeting in terms of enrollment and funding. Uh, this is our recommendation for surplus appropriation. Um, but as I said, uh, there are a couple of areas of discretion. And so it's at the board's will to approve this the way it is or to postpone it. Trustee Duncan, Duncan, are you proposing a motion to table? Yeah, I guess I am. I just wanted to just kind of hear from staff whether that was problematic, whether there was some reason that we couldn't table it till next month until we do have the enrollment numbers for this financial year. Um, but I'm not hearing any reason not to table it um, unless I've misunderstood anything, in which case, please correct me. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm suggesting that we Sorry, I'm seeing Katrina's hand. Maybe there is a reason not to table it. So I'll just cede the floor in case we have some further input. 
Thank you, because I can't see Katrina's hand, but uh, please, if go ahead, Katrina. Yeah, uh, my only comment is that our financials must be approved by September 30th, and the note um, makes up part of the statement, so that note does have to be finalized um, prior to September 30th and approved by the board. Does the note include the first motion or just the second two? Um, if, let me find. It includes the first uh, motion it does, eh? in the notes. Okay, thank you. Uh, just while you're looking, uh, Trustee Rob Painter. Uh, thanks very much for this. Uh, I, the clarification I'd be seeking uh, based on, on what we just uh, uh, heard from the uh, Assistant Secretary Treasurer, uh, is it possible to uh, uh, suspend those non or those discretionary funds, move forward with the non-discretionary. Uh, does that meet our our obligations as of September thirtieth, or do we have to address the entire package? For me, I think that we've heard what the board has to say around wanting to discuss some of these figures uh, more in depth, perhaps once the enrollment and the um, once the enrollment and the funding has been updated and, and a preliminary, very preliminary um, deficit has been calculated. We know that as soon as we pass a budget or pass financial statements, uh, things change as we move toward our amended budget. And so with the assembly's, um, I guess, uh, goodwill, I wonder if they would approve this in order to uh, have the financial statements approved and then we commit to revisiting it uh, once the enrollment comes in. We know we move toward an amended budget with changes. And so uh, I think um, the items that the board wants to discuss would be no different. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments? Trustee Brian Painter. Thank you, Chair. I, I, I suppose maybe I've lost a thread. I'm just unclear if we're currently debating the motion to refer or if that was seconded and is on the floor. I'm sorry if I've lost the thread. No, the motion was never seconded, so it's not okay, on the thank floor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Trustee Rob Painter. And, and and I do apologize. I just want to make sure I've got this straight in my head. Uh, if uh, we were to move forward and approve this, as as stated, I recognize there are non-discretionary elements. But for the discretionary elements, the if I'm not mistaken, the infrastructure initiatives and uh, uh, reserves, uh, would those would those be held uh, and uh, would be available for board consideration uh, at a subsequent meeting? Is that what I understand? Or is that, that what was explained? Go ahead, Secretary Treasurer. Yes, um, I would say that reserves uh, that were not approved on June 3rd, I would say that the June 3rd reserve is uh, a decision that was made by the board, but the additional reserves and the infrastructure grants uh, or infrastructure initiatives uh, would be discretionary and could be amended as we uh, move into discussion and amend the budget in February. Okay, so I'm just going to um, try and wrap up and clarify what I'm hearing here for the board. So what I'm hearing with this motion is that this motion allows us uh, to approve some spending now that will free up some money. And as we go through the board or the, the budget consultation process, sort of as some of this money shifts into the front end of the year, some money is gonna shift out of the back end of the year. And we're gonna to continue to have discussions on our spending through our budget committee, um, which will determine as, as the secretary treasurer has said, uh, that the amount of reserves that dis will definitely be a discussion on many occasions as we go forward on the year. Uh, infrastructure initiatives will also continue to be a discussion as we go forward throughout the year. Um, 
So for me, I think that in order to pass the financial statements, trust me, nobody wants to change the notes in that. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I think that we can move forward and uh, we can appreciate and I think bring this back to our budget committee working session so that we can look at it further and we can see how these reserves and the infrastructure initiatives do move forward and how those dollars go forward. But I just would look to the secretary treasurer to confirm, is that what we're doing? <laughs> yes, that's what we're doing. I would just uh, perhaps clarify one thing you said. My understanding is that the uh, infrastructure initiatives and the additional surplus um, are to be discussed by the board uh, once we bring enrollment and uh, projected funding and deficit um, and not wait for the budget committee because that may take some time. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we can certainly discuss the reserve throughout the year because that is just an amount that sits, but the infrastructure initiatives uh, we should be moving on if the board wants to move on them. But uh, what I heard was, uh, let's approve the note in the financial statements as is, and uh, staff will bring back uh, the enrollment, the projected uh, revenue and potential deficit, and the board will make a further determination at the next meeting. Was okay, the postponement I thought I heard. Thank you. Does that clarify this for everybody? Are there further questions? Trustee Duncan. I'm just going to rephrase it in my own words, and please yeah. pardon me if I'm wrong. I want to make sure I understand yeah. this. So what we're doing is the, the notes aspect of what we're approving in, in the financial statements. The only thing that pertains to the notes would be the non-discretionary aspects of what is in this motion. The discretionary aspects, we will as a board effectively table until we get the enrollment numbers and have an opportunity to discuss, or do I have that wrong? Secretary Treasurer. It's just a little bit in reverse. So the non-discretionary amounts um, are not up for discussion. Uh, we don't have a choice around what to do with those, but the non, um, the, the items that we do have discretion on, the infrastructure initiatives and part of the additional reserve, uh, you do have discretion over. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Leonard. So maybe, maybe for clarification for Trustee Duncan, we're going to approve everything tonight as it is, but we will discuss those other two amounts at a, at a next, probably the next board meeting, the facilities and the discretionary. Right. Okay, any other comments? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Okay, all those opposed? And the motion carries, thank you, unanimously. Trustee Ryan Painter, do you wanna read the next two in from the committee? Yes, Chair, and given that committee has uh, approved uh, unanimous uh, moving of both of these, I'll read them together. Uh, so okay. first, uh, that the Board of Education of School District Number 61 Greater Victoria approved the audited financial statements of School District Number 61 Greater Victoria for the year end June 30th, 2021, and that the Board Chair, the Superintendent, and the Secretary Treasurer be authorized to execute these statements where applicable on behalf of the Board. Next, that the Board of Education of School District Number 61 Greater Victoria Approve the schedules as required by the Financial Information Act for the period July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, and further, that the approved schedules be posted on the district website. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your hands. Sorry, Chair, just one quick. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, I didn't see your hand. Trustee That's Duncan, okay. before we vote. I just... <laughs> And your uh, hand blends into the white background. <laughs> um, yeah, just a quick question around um, the remuneration. So I'd asked a question around um, the in a way that trustee remuneration and or expenses rather is indicated in the statements. And I'm just wondering, once we get that clarification um, of how those expenses were calculated, um, do we just simply amend the financial statement if it's required? Or what would be the process for doing that? 
Oh, that's a big deal. Uh, Secretary Treasurer, because I do believe that our Deputy Secretary Treasurer did find us an answer. Go ahead. Yes, I just, uh, during the break or um, looking. early in the meeting, I emailed uh, trustees the inquiry you had prior, Trustee uh, Duncan. And so the um, expenses associated with each trustee are correct. Uh, I did double check them myself and they were um, prepared by the financial services team. And so we're able to provide those details to you as you need them, but uh, we would not be amending the report. Okay, thank you, Trustee Duncan. Yeah, great, thank you. I look forward to um, reading those. Thanks so much. And thank you, Katrina. Thank you. Okay, so again, all those in favor of the motions, please raise your hand. Okay, and those opposed? Okay, the motions carry. Thank you all very much for that and for all of that information. Next, we're gonna to go to district leadership reports uh, and we'll go to the superintendent's month, monthly report. And I'm sorry, interim superintendent's report. Thank you. Uh, I just wanna point you to page 221 in the packup, which is my monthly report. You'll see it as submitted. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, but I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Are there any questions for the interim superintendent? No, I just wanna thank you very much for the report. It is uh, very fulsome and there's a lot of information in there and I really appreciate that. Uh, so I just wanted to make that comment of thank you very much for, for that. Uh, I really like how it's aligned to the strategic goals. Uh, Trustee McNally. There Thank you are. You. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Um, it's just, I'm sorry about the phone issue, but I'm finding it really difficult to um, find, uh, you know, the extensive reports and scroll back and forth on my phone. It's me, it's nobody else. But I wondered if in that superintendent's, uh, interim superintendent's report, did that include page 262 um, and 265? Because I have three, just three questions on those pages. Uh, 260, I don't think so. She's okay. in the 220s. <clears throat> Somehow we uh, went right by the uh, 140s, so. Um, uh, so let's get you in the trustee question for a second, okay? I'm sorry, okay. trustee. Allie. No worries. That sounds like a really yeah. good place for me to do this, given my issues with <laughs> scrolling around. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It is a very, very large pack up this evening. Okay. So that being said, uh, do I have a mover for the motion to approve this interim superintendent's report? Trustee Duncan and Trustee Ferris. All those in favor, please raise your hands very much that is uh, unanimous next we have the ombudsman's quarterly report for your information is there any questions on that okay seeing none i'm going to turn the page next we have the framework for enhanced student learning that i was discussing earlier i hope everybody out in the public has had a chance to quickly review that because i think it is an amazing document and i'd really like to thank all of our staff for their hard work on that before we put a motion on the floor i just want to ask if there are any partner groups that would like to speak to the motion okay so seeing none we have a motion. Is there a mover? Trustee Ferris and Trustee Ryan Painter. I'm just gonna read that out, that the Board of Education of School District Number 61, Greater Victoria, approve the framework for enhancing student learning as presented. And again, please, everybody, if you out in the public, if you haven't had a chance to look at this yet, I really highly recommend it. So if there are no questions or comments on the report as it was re presented at Ed Policy as well, I will call the question. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. Okay, are those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Trustee McNally, we are at trustee questions. 
And I'm going to go to you first, just because I feel bad I missed you. Thank you. Well, let's get my note of the way then. Um, back on page 140, just near the top, <clears throat> in one of the little boxes, there was a reference to um, future replacement of the Oak Bay Learning Center and the turf field. And I'm wondering what the timelines um, are on that projection, because I think they're both only very close to being new. So if I could have some more information on that, um, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Who has an answer for me on that? Um, what okay. page? One, she says 140. I'm just still trying to get there. <laughs> My 140 is part of the financial memo. Yeah, mine is that too. correct? I think so. Does it both. say page nine of nine at the top right hand corner? Yes, the second bullet, other capital includes. Okay. Yeah, so this is, uh, so the artificial turf field at Oak Bay High School, uh, we have partners uh, that put into a um, uh, capital fund. And so that builds over time for the replacement of Oak Bay uh, turf field. And so that's a source of other capital. That Thank you for that. I, I, I just wondered about the timeline, Secretary, to the Chair to the Secretary Treasurer. I'm uh, um, just wondering when when we expect to have to replace that turf field and when we have to um, expect to do any upgrades to the Oak Bay Learning Center as, uh, you know, time flies. But I, I thought those, you know, my impression is those were both pretty new facilities. Yeah, so the Oak Bay uh, artificial turf field was uh, just replaced by warranty last year. Mm -hmm. And so we shouldn't have to replace that uh, artificial turf for at least 10 more years. And the learning center, please. I'm not seeing the learning center, sorry. Mm -hmm, it's in there. The, I, I... the neighborhood learning center? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I guess that would be um, some contribution from partners either to, as well. Um, we wouldn't necessarily replace the Neighborhood Learning Center. We would uh, simply be maintaining it. I think it's upgrades. And I'm wondering, as if it's brand new, so to speak, um, why that's in there. <clears throat> uh, I can either ask uh, Katrina or we can bring it back with some more detail for you. Yeah, if you'd bring it back, please. Thank you. Sure. Um, Chair, would you like me to do my other three questions now? Yes, please. Get them down. Okay, on my page 262 on my phone, uh, <clears throat> there's a, a reference to school profile funding, and it's, um, I believe it was presented as a sort of an experiment to see how um, it would work for a couple of schools who had volunteered to do that. Um, and I'm wondering that, uh, is this a preparation for uh, the possibility of a ministry profile funding package. Um, you know, that's always on my mind and uh, how I feel about it. Thank you. Secretary Treasurer? Uh, sure, getting ahead a little bit here, but um, the uh, purpose of that group is to try to move away from formula based. So um, Julie always gives a good example of uh, you know, admin time or uh, some of those uh, district allocations that we give to schools that are cut and dry at a certain point. Uh, so if you have 499 students, you get a certain amount of, let's say, VP admin time. If you have 500 students, all of a sudden you jump up uh, to another threshold. And so how do we move away from that hard line in the sand to more of a school profile in terms of um, how old is your building? How hard is it to supervise? Uh, what is the training of your um, clerical staff, what is the um, amount of time your admin team has been together? So it's so um, it's a group of principals and vice principals coming together with the financial services staff to try to look at more equitable ways of um, doing the district allocations uh, and some of the human resource allocations that are uh, strictly formula based on enrollment. Thank you. So um, through the chair of the secretary treasurer, just uh, does this affect um, funding for students who are uh, bringing in money under a ministry funding category? Is that in there for consideration? 
Uh, we have, um, we are talking about inclusion, but it would not affect the funding that uh, we receive from the ministry. Um, and any uh, work that comes from the district allocation working group would, wouldn't um, just happen. It would go through the budget process once any recommendations came forward. So the board would hear about, um, the board yeah. will hear more about the profile yeah, funding. Then. For sure. Thank you it's so not, much. Uh, yeah, it's not, yeah. Yeah, I just have two more. Sorry to be getting ahead of where we really are, but um, there's uh, on page 265, there are just two things that I'm wondering about. And one is the last bullet point. Um, it says partnerships will, uh, will benefit. I'm just wondering how partnerships will benefit. And if you could read out the last bullet, I've lost the document on my phone. This is dreadful. Um. On page 265? Yeah. Is this under support of land disposal? It yeah, it has to do with pen, how partnerships will, uh, um, partnerships may benefit or part, I'll try and find it again. The last, the last points, others suggested outdoor amenities be shared between the school districts? No, it says partnership benefits. I think um, up under the heading in support of land disposal, the last bullet says some people express the partnerships between the school districts will strengthen relationships and both school districts will mutually benefit. Is that the one? Yeah, yeah, know? thank you. I, if that uh, sounds lovely, but I have no idea what it means. <laughs> I wonder if um, uh, our manager of communications would like to comment on that bullet. The strengthening of partnerships between the two school districts for Lansdowne land disposal. Is that what you're asking, Diane? Uh, if I can just point, I'm nearly, I'm close to 265. I'm getting there. Then I'll be able to refer to the very thing. Let me just get there. Sorry. I can speak to how that would strengthen partnerships because it's two okay. school districts working together to benefit um, the educational programming for the community. So it benefits our school because uh, our school district, because we would then have capital to invest in other schools and it benefits the Francophone school district because they get to have a permanent home base. I see that that's pretty clear. Thank you for that. And just one more um, on page 265 uh, regarding the survey. Um, there's a point that says some people were opposed or some re replies came in opposed to selling any land. And I'd really like to know how many is some. Well, all the feedback is provided there. If you need a specific tally, I, I'm not gonna count um, all the pages right now, but we could tally those for you. It's all included. I, I, I did read them, but I really appreciate having the tally. I think that's very important. So I'll look forward to getting that information at some point very soon. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you, Trustee McNally. Are there any further trustee questions? Trustee Duncan. Yeah, thank you. Through the chair uh, to the interim superintendent or possibly the secretary treasurer, I wondered whether we'd had an opportunity to um, have any further discussions um, with the ministry regarding um, the uh, shortfall for the provincial um, two, third year of the provincial two, two and two um, salary increase. I know that um, we discussed during the budget process um, and with Ms. Axford that a number of school districts um, received um, less than full um, funding for that third year. And so I'm just wondering if there's any update yeah. that you can provide the board on where we are with uh, discussions around that. Secretary Treasurer. So we've taken the calculation from um, Ms. Axford and the financial services team is reviewing that. Uh, we intend to make that a topic of the budget committee. And so it's sort of in a parking lot right now and uh, we're reviewing uh, Ms. Axford's calculations. Thank you. Last call for trustee questions. 
Trustee Duncan, Duncan, and one more. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, I just have one more. Um, I just wondered, so we've, um, you know, a lot of our learning community has been talking about um, COVID-19 uh, exposure notifications, and we've seen um, the approach be in flux in the first few weeks of the school year. And I know a lot of folks are wanting some clarity on sort of what to expect moving forward. And I just wondered if, again, through the chair to the interim uh, superintendent or the secretary treasurer, whether we have any updates um, regarding what parents and staff and students can expect from the notification process moving forward and, and when that will start. Okay, hey, thank you. Interim Superintendent Witten. So we did anticipate or hope that we would have heard by Friday of last week and we did not. Now we're hearing that it could be midweek before we have enough. Oh, we just lost you, you just muted. But um, we, when we do have an update, we will share it. But no, we have not had any updates at this time. Thanks so much, Deb. Thank you. And I know everyone is working as hard as they can and really looking for more direction from the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health. So thank you again to everybody who is doing that difficult and challenging work. Okay, are there any other trustee questions? Excellent. Okay, seeing none, we're going to move to the Secretary Treasurer's report and her monthly report, which is on page 262. So we'll go back a little bit here. Are there any questions for uh, Secretary Treasurer on her report? Okay, seeing none, the, the motion that the Board of Education of School District Number 61, Greater Victoria, received the Secretary Treasurer's report as presented. All those in, oh, yeah, sorry, Tom, it's Trustee Ferris has moved. I need a seconder. Trustee Leonard, all those in favor, please raise your hands. Thank you, and the motion is carried unanimous, unanimously. Again, I would also like to thank the Secretary Treasurer for her report. I find there's a lot of information in there and it's uh, very informative, so thank you. Next, we are going to go to E2BB, which is a new motion, am I correct, Secretary Treasurer? I think we go to E2BA first. Okay, and we'll do A, A. okay, perfect. So next we have the Lansdowne Disposal Feedback, which is in your packup. And did um, our manager of communications and community engagement want to speak to that in any way? Just that it's all there? Yeah, I can give a quick overview of the process that started um, on, in April earlier this spring. So um, to notify the community, I just wanna go over our communication and awareness efforts. So there were updates to CFS and the Greater Victoria School District's website. We also ensured that there were letters sent to the Lansdowne staff and families and uh, letters sent to the Lansdowne feeder schools as well. In addition, um, following the notification requirements for the District of Saanich, uh, which is to send letters to neighbors within 90 meters. We distributed, we, we hand delivered over 500 letters to nearby neighbors and ensured that um, commercial properties were also included. And we had the, uh, we had a virtual open house on April 28th where public and members of the community could attend. And we had a feedback period that was open from April 14th uh, till June 14th. Excellent. Thank you very much for that overview. And I also note that the Secretary Treasurer has also provided us with an overview and background of the feedback and public participation. Are there any further comments on this consultation? Any questions? Excellent. Okay, so now we are going to move to Lansdowne uh, bylaw Sorry, Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Trustee uh, Duncan. Again. Trustee Sorry. Duncan. I also <laughs> see Secretary Treasurer on there. Go ahead, Trustee Duncan. Yeah, I just had a question around the the feedback. I just wondered, you know, um, as as I was reading through the feedback, there were a few key themes that um, came out of it. Yeah. Um, 
around um, both the history and the community use of the field, um, uh, the potential environmental impacts on uh, Boker Creek, um, sort of issues and concerns around traffic and so on, um, congestion and the like. And I'm just wondering um, whether or not or in what ways um, we can address or mitigate some of those concerns um, as a board moving moving forward on this, whether there's any um, suggestions that um, anybody has around the table about how to address some of those concerns. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer. Yeah, I think a lot of these concerns will come up during uh, CSF's uh, consultation as well. They'll have to go through a more rigorous process than we do in terms of um, uh, their subdivision plan and um, permitting and building permits and things like that. So. Um, as always, we accept the feedback or take it into account, uh, and it's really up to the board to decide what it wants to do. Um, we know that in terms of the field, uh, lands down uh, north is uh, the largest, I believe, piece of property we own. And even after the subdivision and the disposal, uh, it's still the most acres per student in the district. So there is uh, um, a lot of green space there. Um, and so, uh, but I would say in terms of Boker Creek and the environment, uh, that will definitely come up during the um, subdivision and permitting of the building permit. As well as traffic. We know going through uh, the CHI, uh, we had to go before city council regarding traffic, so. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments on the consultation? No. Okay, I am going to move us on to E2BB. Are we yes. doing that first or BB first? B. B. The new BB. Okay, so. It's a verbal, if that's okay. Yeah, please, because I don't have it written out. Yeah, here. so on May 17th, uh, staff had brought uh, reading number one of the Lansdowne Property Disposal Bylaw to the assembly, um, but the board defeated that because consultation had not concluded. Uh, so the three readings of the bylaw are on tonight's agenda now that uh, consultation concluded on June 14th. Uh, so we need to reconsider the bylaw reading for reading number one enable, uh, to enable us to move forward with reading number one tonight. And so at this point in the agenda, um, I uh, am proposing a motion that reads that the Board of Education of School District number 61, Greater Victoria, reconsider the May 17th, 2021 bylaw reading, bylaw reading number one, disposing of 7.3 acres of Lansdowne Middle School lands to school district number 93. Okay, and I believe I need a mover who voted. Okay, so trustee Ryan Painter and a seconder of Tom Ferris. Are those the appropriate trustees that you needed, Secretary Treasurer? That's fine. Thank you. So the motion is on the floor. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, I will call the question. All those in favor of the motion? Trustee, okay, yep. Yeah. Raise your hands. All those opposed? So the motion carries with Trustee Duncan, McNally, and Rob Painter opposed. So what does that mean? Did you need that to be unanimous? Nope, it's a simple majority. Just making sure. Okay, so now we're gonna go to E2BB, which yep, is, please. sorry? Yep, go ahead. Okay which is that the Board of Education of School District number 61, Greater Victoria approves the disposal of a 7.3 acre portion of school district property municipal known as 1,765 Lansdowne Road, Saanich, BC, and legally described as PID 005-852-962, Lot A, Section 27, Victoria District Plan 6679, the property. The entering into the into and completion of the obligations contained in an agreement of the purchase of sale, the purchase of sale agreement, in respect of the property with Conseil Solaire Francophone, 
of BC in the amount of 15, what are we at? 15, what is that number, Kim? 15,232,000. Wow, that's a lot of money, more or less. The granting of authority for the purchaser acting in the name of the board or otherwise to advance certain zoning, subdivision and development related amendments to the property with the District of Saanich and other third parties prior to completion of the disposal of the property. The taking of all such action and the execution and delivery of all such documentation auxiliary to or related to the foregoing and the authorization of the secretary treasurer to execute and deliver on behalf of the board, the purchase and sale agreement and all such amendments thereto and all related and auxiliary documents as the secretary treasurer may in her discretion consider advisable. The board confirms that the board will not require the property for future educational purposes. Read the first time the 27th day of September, 2021. Trustee Duncan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm um, just before the motion goes on. Well, I guess it's on the floor. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> a point of clarification on bullet three. So, um, uh, sorry, bullet two, uh, starting with uh, the entering into and completion of the obligations. Um, my question is about the last line after the amount of 15232000 more or less. So I've not seen that before, this idea of more or less. Which is it going to be more or less? What, what exactly does that mean? Uh, I would appreciate some clarification on that. Thanks. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer. Yeah, more or less would uh, refer to the statement of adjustments with any property transaction in terms of uh, uh, any kind of property tax or settlement of utilities or anything like that. So um, once you go through your statement of adjustments, it might be 15 million two hundred. $31,000 if uh, the statement of adjustments is such that uh, we owe utilities or CSF owes utilities, et cetera, if that makes sense. It does, thank you. Okay, thank you. Do I have a mover? Trustee Leonard and Trustee Ferris, thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Okay, Trustee Rob Painter. Uh, just uh, seeking confirmation, I don't want to belabor this, but uh, uh, the uh, board confirms that the board will not require the property for future educational purposes. W what was the mechanism by which we used to uh, make that determination? It was an analysis of the property size, uh, as in the consultation presentation around the uh, acres per student before and after the transaction, with Lansdowne being the highest um, acreage per student, and in consultation with the uh, principal, um, and the fact that it's such a large piece of property. Uh, so to confirm, we did not look at the potential use of that space for our own expansion needs, considering the uh, current developmental or development uh, objectives of both the City of Victoria and Saanich. Secretary Treasurer. We base our property decisions on our projected enrollments, and uh, it is such that we don't think we'll need that property for uh, educational purposes with it, our uh, future enrollment. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions? Okay, seeing none, I will call the question. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? Okay, so the motion carries with Trustee Rob Painter, Trustee McNally, and Trustee Duncan opposed. Okay, so... I'm going to read a second time, the 27th day of September, 2021. Do you really want me to read all of this out again? No? Okay, <laughs> Trustee Duncan, or McNally, sorry. Thank you. Um, Chair, could you just read the salient points so that I don't have to scroll through my phone again and try to find out what these changes are? Okay, well, I'm not changing anything. I'm just doing the second reading of the same motion. I know, but what, 
Can you okay. pick out the so the So point? the disposal of 7.3 acres, uh, we will enter into a completion. Why don't I just read it? It's just easier than pulling out the points. The Board of Education of School District Number 61, Greater Victoria approved the disposal of a 7.3 acre portion of school district property municipally known as 1765 Lansdowne Road, Saanich, and legally described as a lot A, Section 27, Victoria District Plan 6679. The entering into and completion of the obligations contained in an agreement of purchase and sale in respect of the property with uh, SD 93 in the amount of 15232000 more or less, the granting of authority for the purchaser acting in the name of the board otherwise to advance certain zoning subdivisions and development related amendments to the property with the district of Saanich and other third parties prior to completion of the disposal of the property. In taking of all such action and the execution and delivery of all such documentation auxiliary to or related to the foregoing and the authorization of the secretary treasurer to execute and deliver on behalf of the board, the purchase and sale agreement and all such amendments thereto and all related and auxiliary documents as the secretary treasurer may in her discretion consider advisable. The board confirms that the board will not require the property for future educational purposes. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed. Um, Trustee Waters, were you opposed or for? In favor. Thank you. I just couldn't catch your hand there. Okay, so the motion carries with the same trustees opposed. Okay, so the next motion that the Board of Education of School District Number 61, Greater Victoria, agree to give all three readings of the bylaw number 212103, disposal of surplus land located at 1765 Lansdowne Road, Victoria, BC, at the September 27, 2121 Board of Education meeting. This motion must carry unanimously to continue forward. All those in favor of Trustee Painter, question? Uh, I'm just trying to understand procedural. Uh, my understanding is that we can't do more than two readings on a, at a single meeting unless we're unanimous. So I'm just not sure where we're going on this one. Okay, so we need to, we need, if we pass the next motion, which agrees to the three me meetings unanimously, then we can do three readings. If we do not pass this motion unanimously, we cannot do three readings. My apologies, I scrolled too far. Okay, thank you. So I'm looking for a mover and a seconder for this motion. Trustee Ryan Painter and Trustee Ferris. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. Those opposed? And the motion is defeated. Can you okay. read who is opposed? The three? Uh, the three, yeah, thank you. Excellent. Okay, hang on, I got to flip a page here. Okay, so our next item of business. Wow, there's just so much tonight, you guys. Thank you all for your patience and for the public for hanging in there with us. So C, next is the revised bylaw 9140 ad hoc committee of the board for the second and third reading of the bylaw. So this is again in your packup. Uh, page 362, it says. <laughs> okay. Motion motion on the floor. Floor. Thank you. I'm just sorry. I'm still trying to scroll right to it, but maybe we'll just wait. Okay. So the motion is that the revised bylaw 9140 ad hoc committee of the board be, wait, that's not the full motion, be read. A second time, the 27th day of September, 2021. Trustee McNally. Thank you, Chair. This is actually, the, I got ahead of myself and uh, uh, you wound up reading the whole previous bylaw. Um, this is the one where I'm wondering what the salient points of the change to this bylaw are. They shouldn't be as long as the previous one. No, they won't be, because if you could look at, uh, we could get here to 362, which goes on forever. There are, I believe, if I'm correct, there's really only two lines and it's marked in red. So you can see the changes specifically. 
If you could see them, can't you read them out, Cheryl? Yeah, I'm I'm just scrolling here like crazy. Hang on. Thank you. Thank you. Three lines. Who's got it? There's three lines. Thank you. <clears throat> Trustee Leonard's. Oh wait, no, I've just gotten there. So one, the one changes uh, the insertion of number four. The membership of the committee shall select a chair at the first meeting of the committee and select a note taker at each meeting. The next change is the strikeout of ad hoc committee meetings will be attached to and reported by a member trustee at the appropriate standing committee. That has been struck out. And instead, a member trustee will be responsible for providing the minutes and reporting to the standing committee has been inserted. And then additionally, the last point 14 has been added that an ad hoc committee meeting materials, including agendas, minutes, reports, and up-to-date terms of reference for all ad hoc committees will be posted to the district website. And that is, those are the changes. And, and some numbering. All right. So I, re, did I get a mover in a second or I don't believe so. Trustee Duncan and Trustee Leonard. Thank you. Is there any discussion on this bylaw? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hands. Thank you, and that motion carries. I'm going to read for a third time and pass and adopt the 27th day of September 21, the revised bylaw 9140 of the Ad Hoc Committee of the Board. I need another mover and a seconder. Trustee Rob Painter and Trustee McNally. Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hands. Okay, thank you. That was our third reading and that one has passed. All right. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda is question period. If you just give me a second, I do have some questions in here. Okay, my computer's talking on me. Let's see if we can go faster by phone. Oh no, here we go. So the question we have. So the question is the presentation the secretary treasurer just made wasn't in the agenda package. Will it be shared? Secretary treasurer. Yes, we'll post it to the web as supplemental information under this meeting date, as well as Trustee Painter requested it be recorded in the minutes. Excellent. Thank you very much. And our next question is, recently I resigned my position as a district education assistant with SD61 and was pleasantly surprised when I received an exit survey from Human Resources. Given the chronic recruitment and retention challenges of EAs within SD61, Will the district be presenting the survey information to trustee and your rights holders and stakeholders? Uh, so maybe I can go to interim superintendent Deb or uh, Witten. I believe if that is the will of the board, then we can uh, work with human resources to bring forward a report. Excellent, maybe we can do that at uh, an ed policy meeting perhaps. Thank you. Uh, Trustee McNally, I saw your hand up, but you were good with my comments. If we can't hear a word you're saying. <laughs> I wondered if you wanted a motion now, but it sounds like the more uh, the better thing to do is wait for ed policy. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will just look to. Um, uh, see, are, have there any been any more questions? I only see the two in my email. Go ahead. There was one more. Um, oh. it, was, it was more of a comment, but it, um, they wanted to say they appreciated the interim okay. superintendent's response uh, regarding uh, the EA correspondence at the top of the meeting. Excellent. Thank you. My emails are definitely slow this evening. And I, I too would also thank uh, Interim Superintendent Witten for her responses to uh, Tracy Humphrey's letter. I don't think we need to go back through them now. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, you can always email questions into trustees at sd61.bc.ca and we'll endeavor to get to them as we can. Next, we have public disclosure of in-camera minutes. Whoops, let me just get back to my agenda here, which are enclosed there for you on page 365, 366, and 367. Okay. Do we have any new business or motions? Notice of motion. Sorry. Go ahead, Secretary Treasurer. We yes, did want to say something. I think at passing of the agenda, we added That's G4, right. 5, and 6. Thank you. G4, G5, and G6. So how are we going to handle that? Let me just get through. So G4 is a three-year lamps and lease. Renewal, yep. Renewal was done. And G5 was, was burned the sign. Side. Yep. Okay. Do you want to speak to any of that? And then G6, sorry, you're going to have to help me with that one. Sure. I'll just run through all three if that's okay with you. Yeah. So uh, G4, uh, we're disclosing that uh, School District 61 and CSF have renewed their lease of lamps and school for three years. Uh, under G5, uh, we're advising that School District 61 and uh, Pacifica Housing and the City of Victoria have find a, uh, signed a framework agreement uh, for some land disposal at SJ Burnside. And G6 uh, will be that uh, the board has approved um, a design and neighborhood learning center consultation plan for the new uh, Cedar Hill Middle School. Thank you, Trustee McNally. Thank you, I wonder uh, through the chair to the secretary treasurer if I could find out a bit more about what some land um, means. Uh, it's in the in-camera packup. So I need to read that, but nobody else is going to know? It's uh, part of lot one uh, that's not required for educational purposes anymore. And so the board will provide a quick claim to the city with ministry approval for disposal of part of lot one. I'm sorry, I'm not, I missed the in-camera meeting. I'm sorry about that, it was unavoidable. So <clears throat> if I wanna find out what lot one is, I can look at the minutes when they're provided in the future, but um, can the public know what lot one is what part of that land package is that uh, we can make something available um, but okay. i can't explain it's, it to you without the diagram from in camera sale of public land is it not yes so chair sorry i just need point of order i'm hoping that trustee mcnally can please direct her questions through the chair and not uh you know, be interrogating the secretary treasurer on an issue that I think is relatively clear in front of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just don't want to bore everybody with saying through the chair to the secretary treasurer every single time I utter a sentence, but point taken. All right, well, more will be revealed. Okay, thank you. Um, where are we now? So new business, Trustee Waters, did you want to where are you? Did you want to introduce your motion? Sure, thank you, Chair. Am I echoing? Somebody is definitely echoing, but it's okay. Go ahead. It's been well, going briefly. On. Trustee Leonard sounded like God there, but I don't. I don't. I'm not calling it. So uh, hopefully, I sound Chair. okay. Chair. So um, yeah. Somebody is saying. I am chair. hoping to speak to this motion. I probably can't oh. after chair or right. Trustee you Waters are correct. Already. You are correct. So yes, we let's go to our partner groups first. Uh, President uh, Waldron from the GVTA. Thank you, and yeah, sorry Angela. about my sound. I'm also having to use my phone to phone in because the internet connection has been unstable. Um, again, it's always hard for me to speak to motions when I when I haven't heard the motivation behind them first. But I believe this motion failed at at the committees, maybe just one of them or at both of them, a, or a similar motion failed. And I I wonder about the board putting their their time into changing their policies on committees at a time where the Vancouver School Board this evening passed a motion to mandate math for K to three students. 
and our elementary schools are struggling right now. And I, I barely heard a word this board meeting about COVID. And I, I really, I urge the board to not spend too much time discussing whether they're going to have nine or four members at a committee meeting and instead to put their minds to dealing with the current crisis in your schools because it's, it's scary out there and it needs to be addressed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I also see uh, President Carver Michael from the Victoria Confederation of Parent Advisory Council. So go ahead, An Angela. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, the VCPAC rescinds its support of this motion. Um, and for the simple fact that over the last year, it's been extremely difficult for us to trust in trustees. It's been difficult for us to feel like we have transparency with the board. And you know, we've also noticed that you have challenges following your own bylaws and rules. And so after discussion with our executive, um, we no longer support this motion. Um, we seem to have a voting block created over time and that's not working for us and it's not working for the board as a whole. So it seems like this motion would introduce like a, me like a mechanism for like-minded trustees to increase their control. And that's something that concerns us because of the last year and not feeling heard. Parents and caregivers um, really have a problem with this board. Um, and, and its actions and its best, but parents don't feel heard and we don't feel like this motion is going to help anything. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other partners, stakeholders that would like to speak to the motion before it's put on the floor? Okay, seeing none, I'm sorry, Trustee Waters, I'm gonna go back to you now. Thank you. So we are known as a dysfunctional board and we do have damaged trust with our community. And my concern is that if we keep doing the same thing, we will receive the same results. In fact, I think that's something that you have said on multiple occasions, uh, Chair Whitaker. So last year we hired uh, consultants to come in and look at our governance practices. Um, from the perspective of being a dysfunctional board and how do we come together and build that trust with each other and how do we build that trust with the community. And this is one of the most implementable suggestions that they brought forward. So to me, you know, the fact of the matter is, is a majority vote at the board table passes motions. So while I really resent the idea of there being some block, because I can tell you point blank, the five, the five, the block, we don't meet separately. We're not having conversations. Um, we're, not, we're not doing that, but we do all, just like all nine trustees come to the table and vote our conscience, because that's, that's our job, right? Um, and so my hope is that if we as nine trustees have conversations at committee, that we're going to be able to maybe actually listen to each other a little better, that we're all going to be there to hear from the various members of our um, community and partners on all the subjects. Because right now, sometimes it feels like a bit of a game of telephone where you have um, one group having heard things at one table and one group having heard some things at another table and then we come together and we have to relay that or we're all making decisions with different kinds of information available to us. We've heard lots of times that trustees at the table have not read the reports that we're at. Um, hey, Trustee at Waters, meeting. I am going to ask you to speak to the merits of the pending motion and not make comments about other trustees, please. This is a motion about how the trustees are gonna conduct their business together. So I'm not sure how I can say that without talking about how we can work better together. It's on public record that trustees uh, have challenges when we get to the board table. So, so let's so, just speak to the merits of the motion okay. and keep the, the personalities out, okay? That's okay, I'd awesome. like to point out that in both of our, the people that spoke before me, both talked about personalities. That okay, so can you talk, please speak to the merits of the motion and we'll move forward. About how fun not to take too much time with this. And Angela talked about a voting block and you allowed that. 
So I think if that's okay for her, then it's also for, okay for me to say that that is a thing that people okay, think I'm going to go to Trustee Leonard. So what I'd really like you. to see, if you could just let me wrap up, I'll wrap up because I don't want to belabor the point, but we are dysfunctional. <laughs> As you can see, as you won't let me finish, um, and you and I can have conflict here. I'd love us to be able to have conversations at the committee table where we can be free of the constraints and to be able to have real, honest, heart-centered conversations about the things that matter to our community with our community and not in a divided way so that we can come together at our board meetings and not be making critical decisions towards the end of the night where it's the first time we've heard from each other. We heard a lot during the budget process of how frustrating it was that trustees had not discussed the issues, that we got so far into our budget process and never had the nine of us had a conversation. So this will allow us to have that conversation, both at budget tables and at the ops table. Yes, it's going to require trustees to put in more work, but this is work together and I think we owe each other the chance to try something different because the current system has not been working and so I encourage us to take the advice that we've received from experts and put it into practice and if it doesn't work it doesn't work at the end of the day it's a majority vote at the board table it doesn't matter who's there to have the conversation at committee but I believe that if we listen to each other at committee that we'll be able to make better decisions at the board thank, thank you, you for Trustee letting Leonard. me finish Trustee Leonard. Uh, first of all, I want to second the motion, please. Uh, oh, that's on the table. Um, uh, I've had apprehension at the beginning, um, thinking about this motion and wasn't sure how I thought about it. But um, in the, the more I think about it and the more we need to all be on the same page when we come together at the board table at the end of the month, I am going to support this motion um, because it's we have been very disjointed and very dysfunctional at our committee levels uh, over the last year. And if we can do anything to pull us together and to have a board meeting where things go along uh, more smoothly and we can have a fulsome discussion at the committee levels, I'm all for that. And as Trustee Waters pointed out, we did have um, two consultants who have many, many years in the school system in the superintendent's roles in uh, tr trustee roles, um, supporting this and bringing this forward as a recommendation to help us through um, a very trying year. So I'm all in favor of it. Thank you. Trustee Rob Painter. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I went back and, and reviewed the recommendations from the uh, uh, the contractors who, who are being referenced here. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not just sure what the status of this report is, if it's available for public. I'll do my very best not to make specific reference to this just in case. Uh, but since it's out there for discussion, I do recognize that the, uh, the contractors did make recommendations of uh, moving into more relaxed discussions uh, at the board uh, level so that we could have not simply uh, one opportunity for every trustee to speak and the end of it, but that there could be an exchange and a sharing of ideas. Uh, I do see references to uh, Committee of the Whole uh, included in here, but the, the key thing that I do not see is I saw no references in the recommendations here to uh, changing the voting structure, which is what this motion would do. Uh, currently, there is every opportunity for interested trustees to come to uh, both education policy and directions and ops uh, to listen, to actively engage, uh, although it is, under, it is recognized that under our current terms, uh, the four trustees who are assigned to a particular uh, committee are the ones who vote. That in itself doesn't make uh, a big difference. As we've seen, um, this particular motion was defeated at OPS and yet uh, Trustee Waters has still been able to bring it forward to the board 
for consideration. So um, I'm sort of at a loss as to what this motion is seeking to improve upon. My last point is that the, la the one thing I find most challenging is that uh, over the course of the summer, um, the positions of chair and vice chair uh, changed. Uh, there, that brings in with it uh, new perspectives, um, new ways of moving forward. And so uh, that in itself for me indicates that the board is already taking action to attempt a different path. And so it is problematic that at the first meeting, uh, the first board meeting that the newly elected board chair uh, is presiding over, uh, we're seeking to create additional variations on that. And that suggests to me that there's not a willingness to consider whether or not the new uh, structure is even capable of making any changes. And I do find that disappointing. So I will be voting against this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee McNally. And then I have Trustee Duncan. So we'll go to Trustee McNally and then Trustee Hensa. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate, uh, I've written down some scribbles here, so bear with me while I try to read my own writing. Um, I do appreciate efforts to uh, make board meetings and meetings in general more uh, user-friendly and more mm, understandable for our stakeholders. Um, and uh, as regarding board meetings, uh, to be blunt shorter for staff, um, parents, community me members um, and stakeholders. Uh, but what I think we're gonna get here as a result of this motion is three board meetings instead of one. Um, in standing committees, uh, our bylaws say that everybody can speak as many times as they want. And so standing committees, um, I can see them being quite long, which isn't in itself a bad thing. Um, full discussion is important of, uh, for the issues, but um, this can be achieved any time at any committee by invoking um, Robert's rules, little provision to relax the rules. That just means relax the rules, they're gone. We can speak as many times as frankly as we want, as long as we want. So there's always that provision um, to relax the rules. Um, where am I? Uh, yeah, I don't think that, um, I don't think this motion is going to actually help what we all know are problems um, on this board of various kinds. I think it might even exacerbate them. Um, quorum in such a situation, if this were to pass, quorum would still be five and nobody can be compelled to come to the standing committees. So uh, there's a possibility that, um, you know, not everybody would be there anyway with uh, you know, uh, the board, the meetings being recorded now, anyone who can't make the meetings as I occasionally cannot can watch them, um, which I do. And anybody who uh, wasn't there can read the reports, which I do. Um, I just have a couple more uh, points. No, actually I think, um, I think that's it. I, I think we uh, um, often still wind up with fewer than nine people at the standing committee. Um, one ridiculous idea I had, I'll save for another time. Um, it involved, well, it's not ridiculous. I like it, but I'll save it for another time. I, I, I do hope um, we can find a way to go forward in a way that's more friendly and open for um, my trustee colleagues and stakeholders and rate holders and parents and community. I know I need to work on that, but I don't think this motion is going to achieve it. Um, so I won't support it. Okay, thank you. Trustee Duncan. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I set out the reasons I wouldn't support the motion at OPS, but just in brief, um, uh, for the benefit of my colleagues around the table who are reconsidering the motion now, um, I really just don't think that this motion um, will have a positive impact. I, at the moment, if the intention is to have us uh, move into a, a committee of the whole and have a more informal um, and inclusive dialogue uh, around the standing committee tables, uh, well, that, that there's already um, procedures within our bylaws uh, that allow for that. And as I suggested at OPS, really what we're looking at is to have chairs or folks around the table to simply call for us to move into a committee of the whole more often and to relax the rules. Um, I think, you know, the idea of having essentially three board meetings um, rather than one is not going to help this board. Um, my suggestion uh, would, would be that, you know, what's going to make the greatest impact is for us all to do our very, very best, um, even where we disagree, um, you know, to create an, an open and friendly uh, and respectful environment. So I think it's more about how we behave around our tables and how we welcome and create a respectful and open environment that respects everyone's different perspectives. I think that's gonna make the biggest difference around our board table. And you know, I don't think it's just simply a matter of changing one bylaw or, or, or um, you know, around com uh, standing committees is actually, um, this would affect other bylaws um, around procedure of the board. So I don't think it's a, it, an easy thing to do either with simple um, amendment to one, one bylaw. The only other thing I would say is that, you know, we've had quite a lot of consultants come and go. We've heard a lot of different recommendations. Um, we've, we've heard some very simple rec uh, and straightforward recommendations that I think would have a greater impact if we're looking to, to create some further change in addition to behaving differently around our tables, um, such as you know, looking at agenda setting committees, including more trustees in, that, in those agenda setting committees, making sure our agendas include reports from standing committees where the recommendation that was supported by the reports coming forward to the board. Um, you know, it really is about, I think, a willingness to engage in a different way. Uh, to be less combative, to work with our colleagues. And I think at a standing committee level, it is a, an opportunity to meet in a slightly smaller group with a slightly different configuration of the board and to have those dialogues um, with our partners and our rights holders. Um, I think that that's a positive thing. And then when we get to the board table, um, you know, we have to be open to the fact that there may be times where we need to table something or call an additional meeting so that we can properly consider more complex matters. Um, I guess there's one more thing I would say, and that's just when I read some of the recommendations from these particular consultants, I'm not convinced that this particular recommendation was intended in the way that is put forward in this motion. And I don't know if it's useful really to, to debate that or to try to unpack that here, but um, I do think that really the point is to be open to an engaging in a more informal way to encourage dialogue and to help us make decisions in a more inclusive way. Um, so I won't be supporting the motion tonight, um, but I do wanna thank my colleagues for you know, trying to bring forward something that they believe is gonna make a, a difference. Thank you, Trustee Hensa. Thank you very much. Um, oh, I've got a lot of thoughts about this and I'm, I struggle with it because I, some of my colleagues have made some, <clears throat> some good points and things that I do need to consider. Um, but there is, I still like this motion and I'm still gonna support it. Um, one point I'd like to, to make is uh, one of my colleagues made a different, made a comment, excuse me, <clears throat> about the chair and the vice chair um, changing over the course of the summer and, and not having faith in the new structure. And I don't think that having a new chair is the same as having a new structure. What I'm looking for is to change the structure of the standing committees. I think that's the new structure 
um, that I'm looking for. Um, the, the, the point of this for me has nothing to do with the voting because I don't think in the end of the day it's going to change anything because we still have to bring everything to the board table and the nine of us still have to vote on it. So whether it passes at the committee and then comes for the vote at the board table or fails at the committee and still comes for the vote at the board table, we're still all voting for it at the board table. Um, what I want is more conversation with all nine of us. And over the three years that I've been a trustee, I've asked several times about how can we meet more informally? How can we talk amongst ourselves more informally? Um, can we have more meetings? Can we have more working groups? And there's been um, quite a bit of resistance from some parties to meeting, not in public, because the point of the public board is to do our work in public. And so if we can't meet to discuss things out of the public eye, then it seems to me that the best workaround is to meet all together in the public eye and the standing committee is already set up to do that. And I'm hoping that by having discussions at the standing committees where the motions come onto the floor at 7.30 or eight o'clock instead of at 10 o'clock, we can be having better discussions when we're fresher. Certainly when I'm fresher, I, I'm more likely to speak at 7.30 or eight o'clock than I am at 10.30. And I'm more able to listen with an open ear and an open heart when I'm not exhausted. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can find a willingness to engage in this different way. I'm, I'm hopeful that this can help. I'm also a bit concerned if, if the perceived block of five, which as I, I echo Trustee Waters's um, comment that that it makes it sound very premeditated and it's not. I come, I don't talk about the votes with anybody. I come with an open heart to listen to everybody and vote my conscience. Um, but if, if the four who perceive themselves to be the minority are being dragged kicking and screaming into this and hate it, it's not going to work. So I've got mixed feelings about it, but I still think it's worth a try. So I'm going to be supporting this, thanks. Okay, thank you. Other trustees, I note I have not heard from trustee Ryan Painter or trustee Ferris. Any comments? Nope. Okay, I'm going to put myself on the agenda. I'm not going to support this motion. Um, and I want to speak, I believe it was Trustee Duncan who made the comment that this recommendation from uh, these particular consultants, uh, that she felt that the, that's not being, this motion is not as they intended. And I did a bit of research and I've talked to a few people, including them, and I do agree that that comment is true. When we look at what, where this started as a committee of the whole, the committee of the whole is a jargon term used when council or other body is meeting as a committee. Uh, the whole group is considered to be a committee which allows for greater informality and sometimes a more contra, contra, conversational style of discussion. Final decisions may not be taken during a meeting of the committee of the whole. So this motion where we now are including votes in what was considered originally a committee of the whole moves outside of the intent of the original recommendation, which was, I believe, for us to come together as a group of nine to be able to discuss items and not vote on them until the board. So for that reason, I can't support it. Additionally, I think parts of the reason this board has struggled is because we have struggled with sticking to our bylaws. And this is again, us changing our bylaw which creates confusion with the public because they want to be able to predict and know exactly what it is that we're going to do and how we're going to make those decisions. If now we're changing them for this period of time, we're gonna do things this way, that is not how we build trust. We build trust with our public by continuing to follow the same processes and being consistent in what we're doing. So my concerns, continue to be there. I also want to notice that, um, or to note 
that we can always do a committee of the whole at any time. I also note that in the past, that often decisions at the committee were decided or the tie was broken by the chair's vote. And just like you, Vic, we will, I will not be doing that going forward. So my hope is, is that we'll uh, support these standing committees as well. And additionally, we discovered last year in the spring that many of our standing committees, because we moved to Zoom, did not include the public, which reduced the public's input into our conversations. So I think going forward where we are much better at Zoom and the public is actually much better at tuning in during our various, whether it's YouTube, uh, I think we were Zooming before as well through different means, that I think that uh, we will be able to do a better job of including the public under those particular structures and changes there. So I won't be supporting the motion. I think that the committees can do amazing work I also think that individually, each and every trustee sitting around the table has got to be doing their work and coming to the table prepared and present in that moment, prepared to listen and be respectful to each other. And additionally, my hope is, is that we won't be, uh, well, I'm gonna, I just hope that our comments about our colleagues will um, perhaps, improve and we won't be making uh, disparaging comments as we go forward all right so anyone else have any comments on this motion okay hearing none i'm going to call the question uh, i get to close chair oh, sorry trustee waters go ahead and again Thank i'm you. just before you start i just want to remind you to keep your comments to the merits of the motion Comments such as dragging, kicking and screaming are not acceptable. Thank you. I've never used the term dragging, kicking or screaming. I'm just using the I'm most- just, I don't think term. that we can address our issues unless we, we are realistic about where we are. So I'm asking us to try something different. That's all. I'm looking through all of the feedback that we have gotten and all the conversations that I've had with all of the folks that we've brought in and I'm trying to come up with ways for us to do this better. I understand that there's huge division on this board and I, I'm not sure that there's a, a willingness for us to work together. Um, but I, I, I want to support us in doing that. I think we're, you know, we're doing very well tonight and I'd love to have more of these conversations because it's great to hear from all of my colleagues and so I'm looking for us just to try something different and if you want to vote down the motion vote down the motion um, this is also a motion that could be rescinded at any time if it didn't work I'm not trying to create three board meetings in a month I'm trying to create greater cohesion and make sure that all ears are at the table when the community is at the table so that we can all come forward and make the best possible decisions for our community because sometimes I feel like our board meetings, we're not able to do that because of the time pressures. And I know that lots of people have said that it's okay if we go late and I cannot count the number of times we've gone past 11. And I understand that I'm a night owl, I can do that, but I worry about our families. I worry about you know, the moms and dads that have to wake up early in the morning and I want their voice at the table and I want them to be there. And so I would just like us to be able to have those really fulsome discussions at committee where we're not as restricted by the rules, where we can loosen up a little bit and just really have a conversation that isn't constricted uh, by Robert's rules in the same way that it is at the board table. Because I personally really benefit from that. And so maybe I'm the only one that thinks that way, but it was an idea that I brought forward. And I think there are a lot of other great ideas as Trustee Duncan mentioned. Um, a few of them in terms of agenda setting meetings. I'd love to bring that. This is the first one I brought forward because I thought, let's start us off in a way where we have an opportunity to work together. Um, but um, I accept the will of the board. And so I look forward to the vote. Okay, thank you. Angie, she's closed. I would just like to apologize that the term kicking and screaming was totally inappropriate and I apologize for it. Thank you, Trustee Hensa. I appreciate that greatly. Thank you very, very much for that. Okay, 
All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. All those opposed? The motion is carried. All right, so notice of motions. Trustee Rob Painter. Uh, as uh, uh, President Waldron uh, indicated uh, tonight, Vancouver School Board, uh, at least according to their official Twitter account, uh, did pass a K-12 mask mandate. Uh, with that in mind, uh, I would like to give notice that I will be bringing forward uh, a COVID-oriented motion uh, for ops. And I would invite uh, any partner groups or other trustees who would like to offer suggestions uh, into what could go into that. Uh, beyond just mask mandate, anything related to uh, uh, existing protocols that we can develop to better protect students and staff. Uh, just would like to put it out there that I'd like some input from others. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Trustee McNally. Um, point of order, I guess. Um, don't we need three readings of a bylaw change? I guess it is a bylaw change, isn't it? I so, think so. I guess we do have to do that. Uh, I see Trustee Duncan has something to say. Yeah, and I just want to... Sorry, Chair, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to let Trustee Painter know he's next, but go ahead, Trustee Duncan. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I just, I wanted to point out again that um, there's other bylaws that are potentially affected too. So I think I would suggest that, you know, given that the majority of the board is um, in support of the motion that um, a draft bylaw or the changes to all of the, the, the bylaws that would be affected and would need to be amended, um, we be brought forward, uh, I don't know, through one of our standing committees, um, because it's not um, clear to me uh, what, you know, amendments would need to be made. I, I don't think it's just going to be one bylaw that needs to be amended. So just a procedural suggestion, because obviously we can't proceed um, with what we've got. Are we on the previous motion? Uh, Trustee McNally has raised the point that what your motion is asking for is for a bylaw change. So she has made the suggestion that we need three readings and Trustee Duncan is uh, making suggestions for process. I would recommend that we go to our secretary treasurer who may be able to support us. There she go, there she is, go ahead. It is indeed a bylaw, and so it would require three readings. So um, given the support from the assembly, we could bring forward the revised bylaw, making these changes and bring it back to the board. Okay, I think I just uh, noting our rules. I do think we have to do that. So I will, Yes, we will have some discussions on how that's going to come forward next. I don't have the solutions in front of me at the moment, uh, but I did want to go to trustee Ryan Painter who had his hand up as well. Maybe he has some suggestions or different. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it's just part of notice of motions chair. I apologize. I won't be able Thank to you. shed any light on this one. Um, so uh, no, it was just actually, uh, I had sent um, a motion for ed policy and just reflecting on trustee Rob Painter's COVID uh, uh, piece, uh, my motion for ed policy will be around asking the province to move to a K-12 mask mandate uh, for all school districts. So that will be coming up at the next ed policy meeting. My apologies for not sharing it with the rest of the board. It was a tiring week for me last week, but uh, I can certainly send a memo once I have it prepared on Wednesday. Thank you. To me or I'm sorry. Where uh, I'll send it to, I'll send it to all trustees when I send it to um, the Okay, I be just I have be posted for that. the agenda. Yeah. Sorry, I just thought I, I missed that. No, I, I think I only sent it to staff. I neglected to send it to my colleagues and I'm just may culping on that. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Waters. 
And I'll bring forward a motion to ops around um, the inclusion of a rotating trustee on the chair and super agenda setting committee as per the recommendations that we've received. Okay. Ooh. Any other notices of motion? Because that's a lot. Okay, and I think as far as these bylaws go, or the bylaw changes go, I think we were gonna have to get back to the board as to how we're gonna move forward with that because we don't have any solutions this evening. Thank you, Trustee McNally for raising that point to keep us on track. All right, and next, after a long evening and almost 400 pages, I am looking for a motion to adjourn. Trustee Duncan? Seconder? Nobody wants to go home? Trustee Rob Painter? All those in favor, please raise your hands. All right, everyone, thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>